Howdy, everyone. Welcome back to Unsafe Space. Two live streams in a day. I can't believe it. It is still Friday, but it is now 3 p.m. Pacific time. It's not Covfefe break, but I'm still Carter. And I am here with Carrie, as usual. Hi, Carter. Carrie and I are very excited today. We get to speak with Seamus McNamara Coughlin, the comedian animator behind Freedom Tunes. I, everyone has to know who Freedom Tunes is, but if you don't, uh, Seamus is a libertarian American animator, political cartoonist, commentator, comedian, columnist, and YouTuber. He's known for his YouTube channel, Freedom Tunes, and, it, and his foundation for economic education series, Common Sense Soapbox, with Seamus Coughlin. Seamus taught himself to animate at the age of 12 and has been doing freelance animation work since he was 14. He started his own YouTube channel in 2012 when he was 17. In January 2018, his channel surpassed 100,000 subscribers. As of September 2019, his channel has over 350,000 subscribers and over 46 million views. Since 2017, Coughlin has been a contributor to the Foundation for Economic Education. He's a regular guest on Tim Pool's TimCast podcast, where his initial appearance received the most watch time of any episode, which is pretty impressive for a Tim Pool episode. Uh, he's got lots of links to his YouTube channel, Twitter, other social media feeds. Facebook minds, all that stuff. We'll put them in the in the show links below. Uh, long intro, but Seamus, welcome to Unsafe Space, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I, I want to mention I'm probably closer to the, the conservative end of things nowadays, but that was that was a very kind introduction, and I'm really happy to be here with you guys. And you're and well, I should say it is, so, what, Yeah, and what I should mention too. It is. It is. It's so it's pronounced Coglin. Everyone says oh, Coughlin. No, it's okay because there are a lot of people out there who are traitors and they have the same last name as me, but they let people say Coughlin. And so I can understand where you're confused because a lot of people just roll with it. Coughlin, Seamus, I'll fix it. You have, Thank you. you. You have the most Irish name and it happens to be Irish Month. So, oh, that's right. Yeah, so welcome to the Irish Month podcast. I thought it was Women's History Month. Oh, that too. Yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> no, it's Irish. But can you speak in an Irish accent for the whole interview, though? That would be great. If I really wanted to offend people, I suppose I could speak in an Irish accent. <laughs> you know, it's funny. People, people who are actually from Ireland hate when ethnically Irish Americans call themselves Irish. And it's like, dude, I'm not bragging. All right. This is not like something to be proud of. Okay. I'm, it's an admission. And also, I'm stuck with it because my name is Seamus McNamara Coglin. Like, what am I going to do? <laughs> yeah, uh, you're kind of stuck with it. Um, wait, so what? Cha so you would describe yourself as conservative? I want to jump into what, like jump well, into that no, right I, away. What changed I, from your 2019 description of libertarian? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm still very libertarian on many issues. I just think that, like, when it comes to my fundamental conception of what human rights are, I'm more conservative. So I talked about this a bit on the Babylon Bee podcast. But as I got more into my Catholic faith, I just learned that the underlying philosophy of libertarianism, at least as it's understood with respect to it being a classically liberal philosophy, is not entirely compatible with, with the Catholic faith and our conception of what rights are as, as Catholics. So I've become more traditionally conservative in that respect, but I very much believe in the principle of subsidiarity, which is to say, I believe that everything that can be handled by the most local possible authority should be handled by the most local possible authority. And I basically want the federal government out of everything. I want to abolish the federal reserve. I want to pull us out of the wars in the Middle East. So I wouldn't say I'm like a traditional like establishment conservative in that respect. And I still have many heavy libertarian leanings. Uh, I also very much love Ron Paul and I'm in line with him on almost everything policy-wise that, that he's proposed, probably like 90 to 95% of it. So it hasn't been a gigantic shift with respect to the actual policies I would promote, but my underlying views uh, are, are just much more Catholic, I'd say. That's fair. I don't think I don't think it's... One, one gripe I think a lot of people have with libertarians is they don't have any solid philosophical foundation. They're kind of uh, um, foundationless, and they've got like a bunch of agreed upon... Hey, we want smaller government, but the reasons why are kind of all over the place. Um, and so yeah. that makes well, sense. And, and it's unfortunate, though. I think you can say that about basically every modern school of political thought on everything. Yes. It's really hard to look back on it, especially because, you know, in the United States, we have a democratic system where there are two parties that have come to define the competing ideologies. And those parties are, are constantly changing based on what's a popular amongst voters and also what the donor class wants. So it's really hard for anyone to have a consistent philosophy in politics right now. Well, and are they even, I don't even know that we have the culture to support consistent philosophy anywhere. So yeah. it's not surprising. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't know that it stems from 
Republican donors necessarily. That's it's fair. Just- no, it, it's not necessarily that, but it just is the case that it's it's always been a war, at least for as long as the terms have existed. It's been a war between liberalism and conservatism or um, the right and the left. And we get these terms from the French Revolution. The left were basically the, the opponents of tradition and the natural order and the church. And then the right were the people fighting the left. And that's what's interesting. People will point out that there aren't many thinkers on the right who are coming out with anything that's all that new. And they say this as if it's some kind of decimation of a conservative of, of the conservative perspective but the point is i mean like we already had aquinas right we already have the the foundations for our worldview laid down we don't need people to come out and fabricate all sorts of nonsense after the fact uh but we pretty much exist in, in some ways in that this is the the danger of your worldview becoming too political is the right basically just functions to fight the left and not allow the left to do all the crazy things that the left wants to do. And as Malice puts it, the new right or what the right has become is just a loose affiliation of people who oppose the left. So there isn't really like this solid grounded philosophy, which which is unfortunate in some ways. But also, well, he also you, says that I, that conservatism is progressivism driving the speed yep. limit. Yeah, and he's right. And many I'd say it's unfortunate, but that's that's accurate. Are you familiar with Jordan? I'm sure you're familiar with Jordan Peterson. Um, Some of the criticism of his books, like his uh, 12 Rules for Life, I've heard is that, well, he's not saying anything new. This is all common sense. And you made me think of that because it it was sort of a a mind bender for me to, to wrap my head around, well, what's wrong with that? That it's, yeah, it's all, it should be common sense. It's just not all that common anymore. There was a, there's a great quote. This is something my father told me the story of a priest whose professor at seminary said this. He was reviewing a book and he said, this book was both good and original. Unfortunately, what was good was not original and what was original was not good. <laughs> I think <laughs> we are very much obsessed with novelty. And this is just part of human fallenness. We want something new. We prefer it, but there's no reason to, right? Just because something's new doesn't mean it's better. If anything, it means it isn't time tested. So there's reason to be wary of it. Yeah. 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 I, w- I was just talking this morning about actually you mentioned the French Revolution. And for some reason, I wanted to talk about this morning. And uh, Edmund Burke, when he was writing about the French Revolution, one of his criticism, I mean, he was appalled. He was absolutely appalled by what was going on in France. And one of his criticisms was kind of this they've thrown the baby out with the bathwater kind mm-hmm. of thing. Like they don't even understand why things are the way they are and why these things matter. They've just thrown everything out and started from scratch. And there's a reason why we have these traditions. There's a reason why these things work. And I'm not making a case for monarchy, although he might have been. But like, there was a reason why things were the way they were. And just to throw everything out and say, well, we have to start over with something new because it's new and everything else is bad. Everything that's existed prior is bad. It's pretty dumb because there's a lot of uh, there's thousands of years of human history where ideas have evolved or institutions have evolved, and often they've lasted for a reason. Yeah, exactly. And this is true with so much of our morality going backwards, and like particularly our sexual morality. The idea was uh, people were monogamous, and one of the benefits of that is you knew whose children uh, belong to who. And now, in many ways, you don't, and people actually argue over who should be responsible for children. Many seem to think that it should fall to the state as opposed to parents. And part of that is because a lot of parents won't step up and take care of their children because we've eroded the moral fabric of our culture. But can you? we need to, yes. No, go oh, ahead. No, 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 yeah, just continuing. A lot of that is these, these novel ideas come around and people think it's very interesting that someone has said something that supposedly hasn't been said in the past, which is supposedly original, but I reject that. There's nothing new under the sun. Every single time someone comes out with some groundbreaking idea, it's almost always something that has been tried and failed in the past. I mean, you look at socialism as an obvious example. This is supposed to be something that's new and trendy and hip among the young people, despite the fact that it was tried and it failed. We know that this is a bad idea. You see this with a lot of the modern philosophies with relating relating to things even like like transgenderism. A lot of that has been compared to the the Aryan heresy of of the first century. These are not new ideas, but they go away and come back frequently. And they seem new because people have very short attention spans and short memories and they don't know history. But the fact that something had to go away before coming back and become popular again means it probably wasn't very good. So we shouldn't sit there and ask ourselves like, Is Jordan Peterson saying anything new? Well, not necessarily. Sometimes he does. He has original insights. Mm -hmm. But we shouldn't evaluate his his merits on the basis of whether or not what he's saying is new. We should look at whether or not it's true and if it's helping people. 
Yeah. What's the first century Aryan heresy? I don't know what that I was is. Gonna yeah. Ask so, that so you. part of what is is said is that, um, or actually, maybe, maybe maybe I'm thinking of Gnosticism right now, but basically the idea that, um, yeah, I'm thinking of Gnosticism. Basically, the idea that the um, there's like secret hidden knowledge that some people have and other people don't have, and that the body is actually not a good thing. It's not like a good created thing, and that we need to transcend it. And a lot of this is found in the idea that your identity is just a basis of how you feel at the moment and doesn't have anything to do with your actual corporeal being and right. the way your body is arranged. Okay, I, I can see. definitely see yeah. how so, I can yeah. see the analogy there to yeah. this new kind of trans ideology. Mm -hmm. um, Gnosticism, not Arianism. I apologize. Right. No, that's fine. I, 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 I don't know either. I mean, I knew what Gnosticism a little bit, but what do you know? What What's the first century Ar Arian heresy then? I, I'm going to botch it right now. Okay. I'm, gonna botch right now. No I'm not trying to put you so, on the spot. Go, no, 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 no. It's, it's okay. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about, because the, the bio that we read at the beginning was also mm -hmm. outdated in that you now have Freedom Tunes has yes. over half a million subscribers yeah. now. And uh, I, I wanted to hear a little bit about how you got into doing animation on your own. What was that trajectory like? Did you work for other, for anyone in the mainstream or did you just start off knowing you wanted to do your own thing? And how did you start Freedom Tunes? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I, in, it says in the bio, I started the YouTube channel back when I was 17. When I was 17, it was not Freedom Tunes. It was just me sort of uploading cartoons that I was making with my friend in high school. And it never really went anywhere. We got, you know, some views on the videos that we, we did amongst kids we went to school with and friends and the like, but nothing ever or went viral or really accumulated that many views. But, you know, I still had the YouTube channel. And so when I was 18, I graduated high school. Wow. I should say in 2013, I graduated high school. That gives you a better sense of the time. Period, because basically everyone graduates high school at 18. I'm not running on very much sleep right now, you guys. I apologize for this. Um, uh -huh. And the end of the week is always really tough for me because I spend the first couple of days like trying to crank out the new video. And so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm running well, out. I'm running out of sleep deficit right now. Thank you for but, thank you for spending your Friday night with us, sir. Of course, thank you <laughs> yeah. for having me on the show. No, I, I I was I was happy to do this. But as I was saying, uh, so in 2013 I graduated, and I remember reading that like the demand for animators had risen 30 percent that year, and I was already animating. I loved doing it, so I said I'm going to start my own small business in animation production, and I did that. And I'd been doing little freelance gigs as a teenager, nothing that was very good, but things I got paid a couple bucks for and sort of boosted my morale. So I decided that I was going to start finding clients and producing cartoons for them, getting paid. And as it would happen, I found a conservative client and I thought, well, this is perfect. I love writing jokes about politics. Maybe instead of doing the sort of, you know, educational or like infotainment type stuff that I would do for a brand, I could just create something satirical that they might enjoy because they were, they were a news aggregate. So I created this character named Dr. Mac. And the reason I created this character and named him Dr. Mac is because his full name was Dr. McNamara Coglin because I didn't know how the <laughs> copyright law worked. And I was afraid that the character could get stolen from me and I could lose the rights to him. So I was like, well, I have to name him after myself so that it's plainly obvious that I need to be involved with the project. So I had this character and we produced probably, we were going to produce six episodes. We didn't end up producing all of them. Uh, the website ended up being acquired by another website, which was much larger. And so the politics got a little bit confusing and I was getting notes on my work that I didn't really like. And so I thought, what if I just started uploading to that old YouTube channel that I had mm -hmm. and I could put anything up there that I wanted. I wouldn't have to worry about somebody telling me this doesn't promote our brand's values. So I just started doing that and I was still freelancing a little bit on the side and still working but eventually the channel started to take off. And so I took a couple weeks away from uploading to produce a bunch of cartoons. And then I released those cartoons on a weekly basis once I had enough of them saved up and I saw that there was a lot of growth. So I thought I'm gonna keep doing this and I did. And, and by the time I graduated college, I had uh, enough of a following that I was able to make a living doing what uh, I do now. And I was also working with the Foundation for Economic Education at that point too. I started working with them mm -hmm. a little bit before I graduated. I want to say my in my final year of college, I came into contact with them, and it's just been uh, it's been an unbelievable blessing. It has been an unbelievable blessing to be able to do what I do and to to have had my channel grow the way that it's grown. A lot of people hack away at a vision like this for years and years and years and never see anything. 
the fact that I was given this gift is something I don't want to take for granted. And so yeah. I, I always try to thank God for it. And yeah, like you said, we're up to 565,000 subscribers right now, which is unbelievable. I mean, that's amazing. Yes. That is amazing. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I try to see it, as I mentioned earlier, is it's true that a lot of the success is that I have a, you know, a great team, great people helping me. There is merit on our end, but again, it, it's all a blessing. So when I hear critics say things like you're overrated, I say, yes, that's correct. 100%. <laughs> this is, this is all from God. I'm entirely <laughs> overrated. Like the, the I, I am not worth this. It is an unbelievable gift. I mean, but I wasn't worth Jesus's death. Well, he decided I was worth his death on the cross. So I'll, I'll accept this blessing as well. And, uh, yeah, it has been a wild ride. To be able to do the thing for a living that you always wanted to do is a little bit surreal. And the hours are long, and there's sometimes where I'm a little bit tired, a little bit miserable, as everyone gets at work, even when they love what they do. And I just have to reflect on the fact that this is an incredible opportunity I have. And, yeah. and I just, I always, yeah, I always want to maintain gratitude for that. Because I know there's also a lot of people who are in this sphere or who are on YouTube, and they'll sort of complain about it a lot. And I think the reason that's become standard is because everyone sort of looks at lines of work like mine and they say, oh, well, like that must be really easier. That would be a great job to have because like, frankly, it is a great job to have. And then YouTubers feel the need to assert that like, no, there are difficult days, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, ultimately it's, it's a dream. I mean, it is a dream to be able to do this. Cause it's what you love and it's yours. Mm -hmm. It's something that you get to control. Like you said, you don't have to take the editorial notes of someone who's who's buying your content. You're just making it for yourself. Um, you also do. I know you said you have a team helping you, but you, you, it, correct me if I'm wrong. Don't you do most of the you do the writing and mm. the animating and a lot of the voices yourself? Yeah. So when we first started out or when I should say basically when I first started out, I was doing the writing and the voice acting and the animating. I mean, I had one friend who would help with the lip syncing. Mm -hmm. my buddy Pat, that was great. Uh, but besides that, I was, I was pretty much doing everything. And then as we started to pull in a little bit of money, um, I was having friends help me, you know, friends with experience and animation, helping me with little bits and pieces here and there. And now it's gotten to the point where, yeah, we do, we do have a team mostly helping with the animation okay. and I'll just try to get input from other funny people on the jokes when I can, but the writing is mostly me, the, uh, animation, the design, design wise. And like the aesthetic is a lot of that's me, but I've hired some people who are really talented and are, are making, you know, sort of taking things in, in, in a direction that I'm comfortable mm -hmm. with. And the voices are still pretty much all me, except for the female voices. And, and honestly, it, it, it's tough because I love doing voices. I love doing impressions and I, I have a decent range, but when you're doing a video every week, you don't always have time to like think of a new voice for the new character. So I feel yeah. like I end up doing like the same handful of voices over and over. Uh, so I, I got, I got to figure out a way to workshop that or, or maybe pull other people in, but yeah, it, it started as me just being a one man band, but thankfully I, I have help now. That's awesome. Do you have a, do you have a, like a, an overarching goal that you're, is there a theme that you're focused on? Cause I, I know a lot of them is economics. A lot of it is mm -hmm. about economics, but not all of it. Um, what's your, if you had to summarize kind of your theme and what you're hoping to accomplish with Freedom Tunes, what would it be? Yeah, so with Freedom Tunes, I mostly just wanna make people laugh at the present political situation and maybe highlight some of the ridiculousness of it all. I think laughter is, you know, as they say, the best medicine, but it's also a, a wonderful disinfectant. People say that about sunlight. I think it's also true of laughter. There are a lot of things which should be taken seriously that can be laughed at. So I'm not saying the fact that you're able to crack a joke about something means it's ridiculous, but oftentimes laughter can, can expose it and comedy can expose uh, the ridiculousness of, of certain attitudes. So I think first and foremost, I just want to make cartoons that are funny and entertaining and, and get a point across and really serve a market that isn't paid attention to by the dominant media culture. I don't think there's anyone on television who's really all that concerned about whether or not their content is going to appeal to a, a conservative or libertarian demographic. Yeah. It's just, it's all about, and oftentimes what they do to be fair is they'll just make things that they think are funny or enjoyable and their perspective as a left-leaning person happens to work into it. And even though they're just trying to make something engaging, it ends up being something that promotes a particular worldview. And I think that that's more or less where I'm at now. I used to really try to explicitly get across a conservative message with freedom tunes. Now I just try to write about current events in a way that I consider to be funny. And my worldview just comes through that because of course the things that I think are funny are going to be influenced by my worldview. And when it comes to the foundation for economic education, 
the work that I do with them is again, always econ based or almost always, sometimes we'll get into civil liberties and that type of thing. But yeah, for that, I mostly just like to, to promote some pretty common sense economic principles and try to analyze things in an entertaining way because people don't really think a whole lot about econ, which is, which is kind of a shame. People talk about econ a lot. Don't get me wrong. They just don't think about it. And so my goal is, me, is to I don't think about people. it. <laughs> exactly. I was going to say, uh, you're on the right podcast for that, I think. Cause yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Carter I mean, thinks a lot about it. I don't, but and so I need and, stuff like this. We need cartoons though. That are funny exactly. about it. And, and I don't think like, uh, don't get me wrong, like, I don't think econ is the end all be all, but it, it's a valuable discipline and it can teach us a lot. And scarcity is not going away anytime soon. We need to wrestle with that. So it's important to keep people grounded in the reality that there are so many resources to go around. And these are the ways we can manage them. This is the opportunity cost that comes along with this public policy or, or that public policy. And working with them has been great because I don't totally agree. Again, back when I was like a hardcore libertarian, I would have said I probably would have agreed with all of the economic views of, of fee. And we're not completely on the same page anymore, but it, it's similar enough. And they've never like forced me to work on anything that I don't agree with. It's basically always just been me pitching topics and them going, yes, or, or it, no, actually, I, yeah, I don't think they've ever even turned down a topic. So it's been a great relationship. And it's, it's great to make something which I think is entertaining and engaging and which is really performing very well as far as videos that that think tanks produce and that economics thinks think tanks produce particularly so i'm proud of what we've built there and also very grateful for that opportunity but it is but i, I did want to mention that too i wanted to sort of uh put fee aside in its own category because that is much more we put comedy in there but like that is much more about educating people on econ and uh with with freedom tunes it's much more about just trying to make the jokes Right. I'm wondering if we sense. can watch a short one since it's your content. If we have permission to show like a minute video, as long as it's not about Arianism. Okay, good. No, no, no um, do you yes, have something no, about Arianism? Because we have. No, no, I'm kidding. I don't. If you guys want to watch any of the videos I've done for Fee, feel free. Uh, is this something we'd want to pick out after the show and splice in, or? Oh no, we're do you doing. You guys this, want me to pull oh, something up? We're, we're doing it live. Something in right okay, now, good. if you want. Yeah. yeah. Carrie sent me one she wants called Wear the Mask. Is that all right? Can we yeah, wear that? So, so Wear the Mask is the most Freedom Tunes, the, the most recent Freedom Tunes upload. You yeah. absolutely feel free to play that. Let's watch that. Right, well, let's, short. let's put it up for everyone. And I'm going to, I hope this works. Uh, so I apologize if there's an issue, but let's give this a shot. Uh, let me know if the sound's okay. Oh, I mean, no one's really next to me. You're gonna kill me! Please leave me alone. I'm outdoors. <laughs> and you're not even at risk. You're like 20. Ah, I'm dying! He killed me of disease! Stop! <laughs> you killed me! Come on I'm now! Dead forever now. You're being dramatic. I'm in hell! I'm, I'm dead now! I'm in hell! Because you killed me! Fine, okay! Fine! Good, thank you. <laughs> hey folks thank you so much for watching uh -oh. <laughs> thank you you're you're That's all too good kind. I, i'm thank glad you. you enjoyed that so yeah that was uh that was an educational cartoon about economics <laughs> i'm hoping it came across uh so that video I, i'm really glad you enjoy that so that was one that I actually wrote a little while back. We produced it this week. We, we released two videos this week, so it was a little bit strenuous. And uh, as, as mentioned, it le left me a little bit exhausted, but I'm, I'm happy with it. I'm glad with the way it turned out. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. It was actually based in part on a story a friend told me uh, about a real event which had occurred in his life. He was out in public, and this lady was just screaming at someone for not wearing a mask, really berating this guy, even though they were outdoors. And then she ended up sitting down not that long after and taking her mask off to eat. I was like, that's too good. That's too good. That has to be a cartoon. Because like, frankly, it already is one. Reality has become a cartoon. Like my, it is. Um, and and then, the way that you show her getting up on him in his space. Because a lot of these people, at least in the confrontation videos I've seen that people mm -hmm. upload where there's some kind of mass confrontation, a lot of times the the person who's insisting that the other, the maskless person put a mask on, they needlessly get into their bubble. It's like, if yes. you're really concerned, why are you next to me? 
go. Exactly. You know, <laughs> well, because because their main concern is owning the cons. Like they want to get up in your face and yell at you. And so, yeah, the the main point of the video is like whether you're a masker or you don't believe in in, in wearing the mask. There's there is a particularly obnoxious brand of person who just sort of wants to stream you down. And I've used that character in other videos. Uh, it when, yeah, when it comes to masks, those people I think are particularly funny because they do get in your space and yell at you even though they're supposedly very concerned about a virus spreading yeah so yeah that that yeah, one was I a also, lot of fun sorry i just on. no i'm just i i love how they escalate right where it's mm -hmm. like this this uh it starts out with some scolding and it you know it escalates into this over the top i'm literally dead like under the grief <laughs> yes. grief stone i mean or headstone uh <laughs> Yeah. It's just it it really encapture it ca encapsulates how I think a lot of these people appear to a lot of us. Um, you know, one minor thing just turns into this uh, overreaction, and it's not just with masks; it's with a lot mm -hmm. of things nowadays in society. So, I mean, we just talked about Dr. Seuss getting banned earlier today. Wow! Uh, you know, there's there's <laughs> there's lots of overreaction. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that is. I, I did not know Dr. Seuss got banned. I'm gonna have to look into that one. I know yeah. that. I know that. It's oh yeah. No, go ahead. Well, no, it's just the, the publisher decided to preemptively ban a few of the Dr. Seuss books. And Carter and I were talking about how it's it's definitely a part of cancel culture because they're afraid of the mob coming for them. So they're just preemptively virtue signaling and saying mm -hmm. you won't be able to buy these books anymore. But then a lot of companies are getting involved and getting on board. So now eBay has said they're they're yanking down any sales any listings of this list of dr seuss books so wow. even if you own one you can't sell it interesting yeah. okay wow yeah i think we live in a culture and this sort of gets to the, to the heart at, at what i was depicting in that cartoon and what i often depict in my cartoons is this culture of constant escalation i mean phony outrage is very much rewarded if you can be the morally indignant person then you win and you're super cool and everyone's gonna give you high fives and you get to post about it online talk about how everybody clapped for you and that very much precludes the possibility of civil discourse because yeah. if you're just sitting and having a conversation with somebody you don't really get to own them but we go into conversations with the goal of winning and I get yeah. that. I do it too. We all do. I make cartoons about liberals doing stupid stuff, right? I'm not a paragon of virtue here, but also I am trying to make people laugh. And so it's, it's a little bit different. And when I have conversations with people in real life, I mean, I do try to hear them out. There's some people though, who don't want to really be heard out. They just kind of want to chew you out. Yeah. And that's unfortunate. And so part of what I've done is over the past couple months, I've more or less just depicted these people as noisemakers. I think I, I used to do cartoons where they would sort of like articulate their worldview and we'd, we'd poke holes in it and make jokes about it. But so often they're just making noise. And that's the whole Yeah, you point. could use the Charlie Brown teacher thing, but speed it up and make yes. it scream and it's the same thing. It's, like, <laughs> it's ah. the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think some of this like sanctimonious performative moralizing um, is indicative of kind of a lack of a moral foundation yourself. I, I, I feel mm -hmm. like if you're really unsure, if you don't have the self-esteem of knowing like, yeah, I'm grounded in my morals and I, I, you know, I believe what I believe and I know I'm comfortable with that, you, you're less inclined to need to, you know, find the highest soapbox and scream at people to prove your morality. Yeah, I think there's truth in that. I mean, there's something to be said for getting up on a soapbox every now and again, because sometimes it's just necessitated by circumstance. People will say or do things that are wrong and you have to chastise them charitably, but it can be required. However, people seem to view it as its own end. And we all do this. I mean, how many of us have had imaginary arguments in our head with someone? Right? This is just something sure. that, that people do. And I would argue that you're correct in saying that a lot of it does have to do with a person not really having uh, a coherent worldview. We all want to be the good guy. We all want to stick up for what's right. We all have this instinct, which is very good to want to fight for the good. Mm-hmm. But it, it becomes weaponized and it becomes twisted when you're fighting for the wrong cause or when you don't really have a cause. And then it just becomes about the fighting part. Yes, yeah. I think so much of a lot of the, the quotes that we've gravitated towards the past few years have to do with like the C.S. Lewis quote about the benevolent, um, benevolent tyrant being yeah. worse than a robber baron because, you know, they're they're. Uh, persecuting you for your own good and with a clear conscience. Mm -hmm. And 
I think so much of the evil that you can see in human behavior comes from people just being disconnected from the fact that they're, once you think that you're doing good and you're on this soapbox and you have this moral high ground, like you can very easily sometimes just lose, lose track of what you're actually working towards. It becomes about the fight itself, like you said. Yeah. And so I'd have to explore this more. I don't know if it's necessarily a modern problem, though I have a hunch that it's gotten worse over the past couple decades or even centuries, but people can't just do self-serving things and acknowledge that they're self-serving. It has to become a moral crusade for them. Whereas I think in the past when people were behaving viciously, which is to say not virtuously, they would just acknowledge that it was a moral failing, but that they enjoyed doing that thing. So they were going to keep doing it. Nowadays, everything you do has to be packaged as a virtue. Yes. Well, there seems to be a lot of, I mean, from, from as far as I can tell, there's not a lot of principled arguments from anyone, as we said <laughs> earlier, but there's rather a lot of secondhand, uh, secondhand v virtue acquisition. So people look to their left and to their right to see what people around them think is correct or mm -hmm. virtuous, and that's what they need to signal, rather than coming from a place of, for example, a religious belief or some other mm -hmm. um, grounded belief that they have come to on their own. And I, that seems like a newer phenomenon, although I also don't know, maybe historically, they've always looked to their left and right to see what mm -hmm. people around them are doing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, people do, people uh, look around themselves, we're social creatures, but it's it's unfortunate because the, yeah nowadays people really seem to only be looking to their left and their right it's right. all about human respect as opposed to to truth yeah, yeah it's about fitting in with there, mm -hmm. there's a there's a a moral uh milieu or whatever and like there's there's a there's a cultural morality that's kind of ever changing it's a little bit fickle and they devote a lot of energy to trying to figure out what is it right now and how do I signal that I'm still part of the, the in crowd morally? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So as mentioned, it, a lot of it just has to do with people looking to other humans for respect. This is something we all struggle with. Again, we're social creatures and being rejected is almost literally physically painful. The way it affects your brain is very unpleasant. So we wanna be, we wanna fit in. They, they, they did studies on this a while ago too, actually. And they found that, I believe it, the, the likelihood of you sticking to your, perspective changes based on how many other people agree with you. So even if there's only like two people agreeing with you in an entire room of people who disagree with you, you're actually significantly more likely to hold to your view than if everybody was writing you off completely. And we've all been there, right? I mean, I went to an art school and I like to think that most of the time I was still pretty clear about my values just because I think in some ways I, I lack that social awareness or at least maybe I used to <laughs> where I would say something, assuming people are on the same page, or I would say something, maybe knowing people weren't on the same page, but not caring. It, it, it may be, honestly, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm sugarcoating it because there has been a lot of difficulty for me. And it, it hasn't always been easy to speak my mind in situations where everyone's disagreed. I know a, a lot of commentators will talk about this phenomenon of like being really disagreeable and always sort of telling it how it is, but I've always been a really agreeable person. So it's been difficult for me to tell people when they're wrong, but I think, I think that that skill was honed again in, in many ways, just because of my faith and the fact that the world contradicts my morals everywhere all the time. So there was always some need to say something, even though it was always supremely unpleasant for me. <laughs> and that's, but that's something a lot of people don't have. A lot of people don't, don't have an experience uh, of, of having to stick up for something that they believed in from day yeah. one, despite the fact that it was being contradicted by basically everyone. And there's something I also noticed being going to an art school is many kids who were pretty left leaning in class, right? You talk to them outside of class and they'd agree with you on more than you thought they would when you actually have a conversation. And in retrospect, I wonder if that is because there's such social animals that they didn't want to disagree with the class when in reality they did, or if there's such social animals that they didn't want to disagree with me once it was one-on-one -on -one, and they just sort of go along with what everybody else yes. whenever they're having a conversation. I, and I, I think it common, could be that. It could be that. Yeah. I, um, I was just looking this up to make sure I got the numbers right. Cause are you familiar with the Ash conformity experiments? Um, no, no. So they, no. they did these, these studies in the fifties and they've done them a lot since then. And they consistently find the same, the same results. 
where the original in the original studies, they would take people into a room and maybe six people at a time, and they would give them pieces of paper with lines on them diff of different lengths. And they would say, pick the, pick the tallest line, pick the mm -hmm. longest line. Yes. And five of the people would be plants and they would pick a line that was not the longest. And the sixth person would go along with the other five people denying reality and denying what they could clearly, what everyone could see with their eyes, they would pick a line that wasn't the longest. Mm -hmm. And they found that something like only 30%, I think it was, of the people never went along. It was a, it was a smaller percentage. It, when I first read about it, it was a smaller, I thought it was a smaller percentage than I would have expected. Really? But now I think it's kind of high. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was going to say 30% seems really high. It actually gives me some optimism. 30% of people. for humans. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah 25. 25% of people never went along with it. That's what it was. Out of how many it's iterations? Fascinating. Like how many? Um, I'm not sure, but they've, they've consistently found that throughout the years when they do these. So mm -hmm. you've got about 75% of the population that will be swayed even to something that's just very simple and patently absurd. You're looking at one short line and a long line and picking the wrong one. Exactly. Men can be women, et cetera. I yeah. think that when you look at the way people behave, there's something really fascinating. I would also say there's something really beautiful and uplifting about the fact that even 1% of people would still stick to the truth when everyone around them was saying something patently ridiculous. Yeah. It shows, that, it shows that like we are, we are as humans, we're meant for something higher. It's true that we're easily influenced by our social circumstances, but that, like that makes sense. Once you understand the biology, what is it in our biology that necessitates we recognize truth? I, th I think there's something spiritual there. I think you would like my uh, preacher Seamus and we may have talked about him briefly when I first met you, but he had, he gave a sermon once about, um, it was very interesting. It was sort of why was why was man w created? Is w what makes a man? Is is mm -hmm. a man defined by thinking? You know, I think, therefore I am, mm -hmm. or um, by doing, or by uh, worship. And his whole sermon was sort of geared towards presenting man as being a creature des designed to worship. Yeah, to so no and love and serve God. Yeah, it was. I thought it was a very interesting sermon. Anyway, but that yeah. brings me to something I wanted to ask you about. Oh, go ahead. No, I, I want yeah. to mention one more thing. I, I also want to clarify and add something. Some people, I can understand people saying like, well, what we call truth is what allows for us to survive when we make those observations in nature. But again, recognizing truth at the expense of social status. I mean, well, yeah, yeah. Or, or, or death even, right? Or I mean, there's plenty of people death. in history. Yes. Who are, yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I, obviously as an atheist, I, I wouldn't call it necessarily spiritual other than metaphorical, but I do think there's something interesting about, um, the, you know, the desire of a human to say, I will live under these circumstances and these are my circumstances and this is my line and I choose to not exist. If I'm, if I'm going to be asked to say two plus two is five, then I won't exist. Um, I, that is counterintuitive, I guess, from a, yeah purely from a purely individualistic evolutionary perspective i guess you could make a, a dawkins like argument about um survival of other genes in the in the pool and that being better off for the species generally to have truth you know uh persist but it's still a really interesting uh quality and it's not common i mean i, I also think 25 percent sounds high yes yeah, really high yeah. isn't it yeah, yeah I'm, I'm somewhat optimistic now. I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. I hope we have that many. Uh, <laughs> I So when I, I met you in November at Tim Pool's election day coverage, and I was so taken by how um, you approached conversation, speaking of conversation earlier, and I really just had a great time talking with you and oh, thank you. was also surprised to learn how young you are because I think you're very wise beyond your years. You're too kind. I told Carter I was asking you for life advice. <laughs> <laughs> you're too kind. You're far too kind. But, Thank uh, you. I was happy to give it. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you about, because you were very open about discussing your Catholic faith with me and with any questions I had. And um, I wanted to ask you if your Catholic faith, how does that inform your work or does it inform your work? Mm -hmm. Because none of your videos come off as preachy to me. I don't, I don't watch it and think you're, I'm being preached to in any way. And, but certainly it must inform a lot of what you do at behind the scenes, at least. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're not a, you don't shy away from talking about it. 
have, have you ever shied away from talking about it or? I, again, I think when I was younger and I cared a whole lot more about human respect, I probably did. Also, I just, before I, I, I launch into to my response, that was a very high compliment. And thank you for, for oh, saying yeah. all that. I very much appreciate that. I will say this. When I was younger, I think I, I much more wanted my religion. I always wanted it to be part of my life, though, to varying degrees. And I think when I was a teenager, especially my my older teens, I was not very faithful. I didn't do right by God. And in many ways, I wasn't even trying. So it was pretty bad. And then around the time when I turned 20, I had a massive reversion, started taking my faith seriously again. And I've, you know, I've just been a work in progress ever since. When it comes to the way my Catholic faith informs my work, it does so in two ways. So there's some work that I do, which is explicitly Catholic. So I've been working with EWTN on creating these educational cartoons, sort of explaining the Catholic faith to people. That's been great. We have one which is finished and published. The others are, are still in the development stage. When it comes to freedom tunes, what I'm doing there, the videos are informed by my faith in the sense that my general worldview is informed by my faith and it comes through in them. But my faith also affects my work because oftentimes a joke will suggest itself to me and I'll think like, I can't make that joke. You know, like as a Catholic, I can't say that. And and sometimes it'll, it'll, it'll get to the point of even being a little scrupulous about it. So uh, for example, the most recent cartoon, I, I wanted to have a conversation with my priest before I published it on like whether or not it, it would be blasphemous to like depict hell in a cartoon like that. But it was it was clear enough, I think, that the joke was about this left winger exaggerating things and not like about hell or the idea of hell, that it, it was fine to put it in there. But I do really try to consider how how the videos come across it and what they communicate. It's why I, earlier on there, there used to be much more cussing in them and bad language. Uh, I think, I think there was even one video a while ago where I took the Lord's name in vain in it. And then in retrospect, I saw, I was like, why did I do that? I can't believe it. And I took the video down. So my faith, I think keeps it grounded in many ways. It, it stops from going off the deep end. And I think that's important too, because you should poke fun at really bad ideas. I don't think that's incompatible with Christianity at all or Catholicism. Uh, but you don't want to go too far. There are some people doing comedy and doing conservative comedy who are really mean. I mean, they'll get pretty brutal. And there are times that like I've gotten really mean too and have felt really bad about it. So I try not to anymore. I, I will, I will never stop apologizing to Dave Rubin. He was so cool about it, but like I was really mean. Oh, to him Dave in a way Tubin. That, yes. And, and, and I, so, <laughs> and he, dude, Dave Rubin was really cool. He actually, I wrote another video with him in it that he like recorded with me. It's still not done yet. We've been working on that one for a while, but I would say those are the main ways my faith, my faith informs my world. It's just giving me the general tools to, to look at the world and understand it through the, the, the light of, of God and see things for their purpose and understand the, you know, to some extent, again, informed by my faith, how the world should be or how people should be behaving in the world. And then, you know, kind of parody it when, when people aren't, because it's unfortunate when people aren't. And it, oftentimes, you know, comedy comes from a place of, visiting misfortune and trying to understand it a little bit better. And uh, also, again, as I mentioned earlier, coming from a place of just, just mocking insanity. So, you know, you're a Catholic and as a non-Catholic, I don't pretend to understand the, the structure or, or what you're supposed to, what rules you're supposed to follow or how, but it seems that the Pope is pretty woke and anti oh, no. everything you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, how does that work? So seems is a funny word with Pope Francis. And there's a few things I want to get into. Seems I, is I, I, intentional because I don't know. I hear you. Really. No, dude, dude, believe me. No, no. And I hear you. I'm not, I'm not putting you down at all. There's some complication and confusion there. There's this weird thing where the press decided that they liked this Pope, that they really like Pope Francis. And I, I think it, it could certainly be argued that he's a church liberal. But... I find that they they never report on the conservative things he said. So like Pope Francis has called modern gender theory demonic. Uh, it's called abortion murder. Talks about really? the devil a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they never. That's never discussed. Every it's it's when he says something about Catholic social teaching that can sort of be construed into favoring favoring social democracy or or, or God forbid socialism that people report on his statements. But. Oftentimes, yeah, you're not really getting his actual. Death. There's a famous picture of somebody handing him a crucifix shaped like a hammer and sickle that was created by some horribly, you know, blasphemous liberation theologian. And there's a picture, you know, the Pope is, is getting it. And then what happens is the Pope actually looks at it and says, no, you can't do that and gives it back to the guy and he's upset. But they just snap the picture of the Pope accepting this thing. 
as if oh, wow. he's endorsing it. And that picture, you know, and I'll even see like good conservative traditional Catholics sharing that going, I can't believe Pope Francis did this. It's like, no, you guys are allowing the liberal media to lie to you about what the Pope is saying. Now that said, as a Catholic, you are not required to believe everything the Pope says or agree with everything the Pope says. Let me explain. There's, there's a principle or concept known as papal infallibility. And what that means is in select circumstances, the Pope has the ability to add to, to Catholic teaching. But it's a very specific set of circumstances. Usually he's correcting some kind of widespread misunderstanding within the church. And he's affirming something that Catholics already believe, but it wasn't necessarily officially codified into our doctrines. And he always invokes his authority as the Pope when he does so. And this is what's called an ex cathedra statement. Most things, the Pope, and they're rarely made. So when the Pope makes a comment in, in a conversation with a journalist, that's not something Catholics are required to believe. When the Pope voices his political opinion, so long as it's not something that has already been stated by the Catholic Church as a non-negotiable, it's not something Catholics are required to believe. Now again, if he's the Pope, he's wise, you do well to, of course, consider what he's saying and listening to it, but you're not bound by it the way that people think Catholics uh, would be. Because he's and still the, the, a man. Now yeah, there, there, there fairness, are other examples though, too. Can I, can I throw something else out there too? There's another yeah, example. Yeah. This when when he first became pope, there was a story that was spreading like wildfire. The pope says there's no hell. The pope says there's no hell. The pope says says there's no hell. Well, that's crazy. He, here's another important part about papal infallibility. He cannot contradict something pre-existing in church doctrine, which is already held by by all Catholics. Like he can't come along and contradict something that was infallibly declared by a previous pope. He can add. He can't change if that makes sense. You can add, he can't contradict. So it would be impossible for the Pope to say that there was there is no hell and have that be a binding statement. But also, not only was it not a binding statement, he didn't say there was no hell. He, he was giving his personal theological opinion on whether hell is a physical place or if it's just a state of the soul. And he seemed to suggest that it's a state of the soul. I'd have to revisit the statement, but he did not say that there's no such thing as hell. But the press runs with it. Pope says there's no hell. Pope says there's no hell. Even some articles, church is doing away with, with the belief in hell. So oh, it's wow. just totally ridiculous. And this is why I would just I would just urge you, please don't listen to what the media says about the Pope. Like try to go to the, the Vatican website for the statements. And also for that fact, like just don't believe anything the media says about anybody. Uh, <laughs> That's a good yeah, it's uh, a good rule, rule of thumb. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I look, I um I hear all you're saying and I think it, I think it makes sense. Um I I nevertheless have a question about the Catholic Church because sure. we've seen yeah. not necessarily about whether you have to uh, agree with the Pope. I mean, I I get that, but we've seen the Southern Baptists um kind of start to go woke in a very um formal way by passing resolutions uh specifically about critical race theory. And you know, I've I have read like I actually have read some of the Pope's statements, and he's certainly not a capitalist. Uh, at least no, the statements that I no. read, he's, he's pretty anti-capitalist. Yeah. Um, and so, are do you are you concerned about um, are you concerned about some of the woke ideology seeping into the Catholic Church, whether or not the Pope has said anything to that effect or not? Are you concerned about that? And and is there a movement within Catholics to try and stop that or reverse any of of that? infestation. I would say that clergy has been trying to destroy the Catholic Church for about 2,000 years, and so far there has not been <laughs> any success. So I'm not too concerned. I, I am upset by, by some of what is said and done by many people in the church. I'm not concerned. I know Mother Church will still be there, and I agree. Pope Francis is definitely not a capitalist. You certainly don't have to be a capitalist to be a Catholic. What the church says is uh, basically you cannot be a, a full-on, total, unrestricted capitalist. You also cannot be a true socialist. There's a good amount of room in between. Pope Francis is also from Argentina. So you just like look at his background and it, it makes sense why he is where he is. And you can you know, you pull a lot of what he's saying or some certainly some number of the things that he's saying out of, of Catholic social teaching about helping the poor and what the role of the state might be there. And so I'm not, I'm not super concerned about woke ideology actually changing the, the official canon or anything like that. But it's true that there, there are a lot of people in the church who are slaves to human respect, as we discussed earlier. And so that's just going to lead them to take a more woke tone, if not outright endorse woke ideas. How much has the Catholic church actually changed since its inception? Mm -hmm. I mean, are there, are there moments of massive change with it? I mean, I know Christianity has had splinters, mm -hmm. you know, groups have splintered off from Catholicism, but how much has the Catholic Church actually changed in its beliefs? 
Yeah, we were talking to the guy who confused Arianism and Gnosticism a bit earlier. So, <laughs> yeah. so, anyway, great so I have exactly the right guy. Go ahead. Exactly. No, honestly, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just getting down on myself here. In terms of how the Catholic Church has changed over the past 2,000 years, again, more things have been defined, but the, I mean, the teachings are the same. You, you go back to the very early church, and it is believed and, and well understood that uh, Christ is literally present in the Eucharist, that Mary was sinless, that uh, the Pope is the head of the church. So when it comes to contextual issues, so for example, I mean, terms like capitalism and socialism obviously aren't thrown around they at that time. Exist, but, yeah. Of course, yeah, there's, there's no theology on that. But as time goes on, basically what the church does is takes her pre-existing magisterium, it takes scripture and tradition and applies that to, to modern issues. So if there, are, if there are changes, they're not so much changes as they are responses to what's going on in the world, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Sure. But in, I guess, in terms I guess, of, but in terms of like the actual teachings, but again, yeah, that, that's sort of a big question. So if, if you were narrowing in on something, well, you can, you can cherry pick, like I, I look at the, the Southern Baptists and they, mm-hmm. you know, the, or, or even, um, you mentioned the, uh, liberation theology, right? The mm-hmm, liberation yeah. theologists can cherry pick scripture mm-hmm, um, yes. to make whatever arguments they want. Yes. And it seems like anyone could really do that if they wanted to. What's 100%. the mechanism by which the Catholic Church can help retard that or or fight it? I love that question. There? No, I, I love that question. And then that no, and that is what that is what the Catholic Church is in many ways. It is a collection of people with very at least when we're talking about the hierarchy and the clergy, and people who are generally and especially historically very well educated on these matters, who, you know, for years and years you could not be a priest unless you were able to speak or understand Greek and Latin. People who have a an understanding of tradition going back all the way to the, the first century. So for example, here's a good principle. You you take scripture. If there are multiple ways to interpret any given scripture, you say, well, how did the church fathers interpret it? The church fathers are basically the earliest in the church, the people who were, were taught by, by the apostles. And if there's question over what a particular passage means, it's, it's you go to the consensus of the church fathers or the majority of the church fathers. They don't always agree on everything, but that's one example. And so it would make sense if you believe that uh, Christ came to earth and sacrificed himself for us and died on the cross for us and that he instituted a church for us to get to heaven and also gave us the Holy Scriptures, that there would be an apparatus for interpreting that. Because like you said, anyone can take it. Anyone can take the Bible and go through it in their current context and attempt to understand it through their lens, but fail totally, right? Because the Bible is a compilation of sources written by different people going back thousands of years. Some of the most you know recent stuff, you know, 300 or, you know, um, 1800 to 2000 years ago or 1700 to 2000 years ago, some of the older stuff, 4,000 years ago, uh, 5,000 years ago. So, or I believe 4,000 is is pretty much the cutoff for the old Testament, but I could be mistaken there. I think that's about right, but I'm not a theologian. Yeah. And and so my point is for a, you're right. That like a modern person can very easily cherry pick this. They can very easily look at scripture, which is why the church has always been very careful to say, we need to interpret this in line with tradition, which is to say how it was understood by our forefathers, which is part of why you can't change. Like you can add, but you can't like go back and say, this is not what uh, the church actually teaches anymore. We're going to reject this teaching because it doesn't fit in with our modern way of thinking. Does that that sort of make sense? Basically the the general idea is because different people have so many different interpretations of scripture and because the, the Protestant groups have split off into so many different subgroups. That's actually the reason, one of the reasons the Catholic Church is necessary, to have an apparatus of people whose entire purpose in life is to ensure that this is well understood and who are also well educated enough to be able to do so because they understand the Greek and the Latin and the writings of, of uh, people like Augustine and uh, members of the church earlier on. So it's like an intentionally conservative mechanism that's like, look, this is, yeah. we're always going to turn back to the original founders uh, yes. of, of the religion. And it and it's kind of got this intentional conservatism in it, which I guess, I'm just thinking out loud here, I guess that's why you would have people splinter off, because if they really want there to be a change, 
it's very difficult to actually happen within that framework. So yeah, and also yes, you don't you want to get divorced, you're going to need to appoint uh, mm. Protestantism, like you know, or whatever. So, yeah. Right? So so here's that that is that is an interesting point. I want to dive into. That. I also want to mention something too. When I mentioned the church fathers, I said people taught by the apostles. Not all of the church fathers were directly taught by the apostles. I want to clear that up. Don't want don't want any confusion there. But yeah, with what you said about the, the Reformation, right? You're right that you do need the Reformation. If the goal is to try to, or, or the revolution, I should say, because it wasn't really reformation. The Catholic Church wasn't actually reformed. People just split off of it. But yeah, you do need that if you want to go make new rules. But right. if, yeah. So, but the, the point is, like we said earlier, new is not necessarily good. We want to look for true. We don't want to look for new. And we also believe as Catholics that the Holy Spirit guides the church too. And so this is a, a supernatural belief about. God's role in the church. And we believe that the Holy Spirit prevents the, the Pope when making an ex cathedra statement from erring. And uh, even though people in the church can err, have misconceptions, and a Pope can even err when not speaking ex cathedra, uh, we do believe that that Christ makes good on his promise that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church and that uh, her teachings will always be rooted in the truth. Can you, can you talk a little bit about, Seamus, about... Um... Uh, for anyone who may not be Catholic and is not familiar with it, uh, you, you're the first person who told me about novenas, mm. which are nine days of prayer. Mm -hmm. And I really liked this idea of, of praying on something specifically. And you said usually people will give up something uh, during that time. Can you talk mm. a little bit about what, what are novenas? And, yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. So a novena is generally a nine day long prayer or a prayer which exists in increments of nine days or has nine iterations. So uh, Mother Teresa would say flying novenas where she would like say the same prayer nine times in a row uh, in, in a moment. Uh, novenas generally nine days, but there are some which are longer. Like there, there's, there are some 54 day novenas, which is just again a, a compilation of, of nine um, or just a compilation of, of novenas. So it's always, it always ends up being a multiple of nine though. When you pray a novena, the general idea is you're asking God for something with consistency because you're doing it for, for some stretch of time and hopefully penance, you're making some kind of sacrifice. And usually you're asking for the intercession of some saint. So how that works is something that's generally foreign to a lot of non-Catholics, but we believe as Catholics that we can ask other people to pray for us. So I could ask Carrie, please pray for me. I could, you could ask me to pray for you. We also believe that because you, there are people in heaven who are with God, uh, that he can allow them to hear our prayers and that they can intercede for us. So we know, and one thing we believe as Catholics is the holier a person is the more effective their prayers are. So the holiest person you know is the person who you want to ask for prayers from because God's going to be more likely to give that person what they want when they pray. And the holiest people we know uh, that we can have guaranteed our holy are people in heaven. So usually a novena will be to some saint. You're basically, you're asking them to intercede for you to go to God with your request. And you'll also fast along with that. So novenas, I would really recommend a novenas to St. Teresa of Lisieux are great. Novenas to St. Anne and novenas to St. Joseph. I've had some wonderful miracles occur with uh, a novena to St. Joseph. I'm saying another one right now. Can't recommend it enough. And I would just, yeah, advise anyone to look into it. And if you're non-believer, if you're non-Catholic, still allowed to say it. Just keep an open mind and, and, and try to say an Ovina. Keep an open mind. I, the, the thing I, I, I like about since <clears throat> becoming Christian and, and sort of thinking about prayer differently than I used to think about it is um, we know, even if you're not religious, that behavior, that your that, that behavior can, uh, ritual or whatever can change your mood can change things for you, can change your outlook and change your mind about things. And I mean, for example, neuroscientists say that if you are having an emotion just by vocalizing what that emotion is and saying, I am angry, that it will like lessen that feeling mm -hmm. for you. So um, there's something to the idea of doing uh, prayers that are, are somewhat uh, meditative, I think mm -hmm. is maybe the word yeah. that I really like. I like the, um, and Catholics aren't the only ones that do them. I, th I met a monk, a Buddhist monk who gave me these beads. I think they're called Japa beads, but they mm. say a prayer on each bead, which I, I had no idea. It made me, but it made me think of the rosary. And um, uh, I, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure if I'm leading to a question, but I like that you are someone who takes your faith seriously and practices it. And like, I heard you, I was in the room next to yours 
at Tim's house and I heard you doing your rosary at night. Like, <laughs> oh. And I was like, that's so impressive. Like, it's just, oh, you it's know, so you're taking it seriously. And Carter. It's kind of creepy, Carter, Carrie. <laughs> I wasn't like, no, but she's up to the door. I heard you at eyes. night in the room next door. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. Part of the reason Carter said he um, stopped believing Carter used to be Christian, but he said, if you're going to believe in something, you have to take it very seriously. Yeah. And he, and it don't. Absolutely. I, yeah. Yeah. And he still is like, it's like, if you believe in something, take it seriously. And he has great, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Carter, but you have great. You well, said, I would, I would say that one of the, I like, I get along with devout Christians who take it seriously much better than I get along with Christians who pay lip service to Christianity yeah. and just do whatever. Um, yeah. Because even though I don't agree with Christianity and I'm an atheist and I'm confident in my atheism, I don't, uh, I don't understand the type of person who can profess to believe a set a set of things and then behave in a way that's contradictory to those intentionally. We all make mistakes. I mean, yeah. you know, I I don't mean I don't mean people who falter and recognize their faults and and try and correct. I mean people who just kind of shrug. I you would in Mormonism you would call them Jack Mormons, right? Who are just like, eh, you know, I'm gonna go drink my caffeine and drink my booze anyway because you know I, I'm just gonna show up to church with my underpants once in a while or whatever yeah. they do. I don't know. <laughs> No, exactly. No, no, I, I think there's truth in that. I think there's a lot of truth in that. I, I could definitely respect where you're coming from. One of the most important parts of, of your faith, I mean, the most important part of your faith is living it. And Carrie, one of the things you mentioned is we know that in, in psychology, it's well understood that your behaviors, even just your gestures, the way you pose yourself affects your mood. So like if you stand with your, your shoulders spread or with your back straight, and they say that can actually boost your confidence to so just the way you situate yourself. And so just smiling in the mirror actually has been proven to help with depression. So if you just wow. go in front of the mirror and smile, even if you I don't mean it, it, yeah. it helps with depression. Yeah. No, it's a, well, there, there's the kind of fake it till you make it thing. But there, there's exactly. also another, there's a really good Catholic saying, you either live what you believe or you believe what you live. And Carter, I think what you're saying is interesting mm -hmm. about these people you meet who are religious, but they don't take it very seriously. Oftentimes, those people won't stay religious for very long. They'll stop believing or they, they already have doubts. It's not that important to them. But I agree. I mean, it, it's, it's really hard because we have a, a fallen human nature and God calls us to be perfect. I mean, he wants us to be perfect. And no, you're, you're not going to get it right away. And he's going to help you. And we can only do these things through him. But I, while I try not to judge people for, for falling short, you're right that there, there's something very sad about people who make a conscious decision not to follow certain teachings of their faith. It's a serious problem. It's a big problem in the church. I think I, I heard a statistic this, this morning that 74% of Catholics in the United States believe that it's okay to cohabitate with your partner when you're unmarried, which is just completely contrary to Catholic teaching. And that is a binding teaching on Catholics. That's not some optional thing. So it's very unfortunate. Nowadays, a lot of people fail to understand reality so they fail to understand God because we've been spoiled and we think that the universe has to exist in a way that will make us comfortable and that God's just kind of sitting there waiting to make a deal with us. We do whatever we're comfortable with, with respect to the commands he's given us mm -hmm. and then we get yeah. to heaven, but that's not how the world works. And it, it's certainly not, not how God works. I mean, he's merciful, but you can't just go off and, and do things your own way. There's the old saying that, 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 that Frank Sinatra song is the, the national anthem of hell. I did it my way. People <laughs> want the benefits of religion, but they don't want to live it. And you can understand why, because the benefits are great and living it is hard. But if you don't actually live it, you're not getting the benefits. It's kind of like going to the gym, which I would know nothing about, but it's kind of like going to the gym and just doing like three reps at the lowest possible weight. It's like you're only hurting yourself. Like, yes, you're at the gym, but what are you doing? I guess I'm, I'm happy that you're in the gym instead of not at the gym. That's probably better for you, but do something, you know, actually take advantage of the opportunity. You've heard the truth. And then also there's this lack of desire to proselytize. And this also comes from a desire for human respect. People don't want to share their faith with others. And it's really sad. And I used to be that way when I was younger. It was, I mean, I would share my faith, but not as often or as vocally as I should have. And in part, it was because I don't want people to dislike me, but Look, I believe heaven and hell are real. I believe Jesus Christ loves me. I believe he died on the cross for you. To keep that to myself would be psychotic. To believe that God wants a relationship with everybody, but not tell people because like, well, they might not like me if I say something. To me is the height of insanity. And so 
Carter, I, I appreciate you feel that way. And I, I'm sure I don't want to put words in your mouth, but one thing I've heard from, from atheists like Penn Jillette, who again, I, I disagree with, but respect is that he kind of, he says like, he can't stand when, when Christians don't proselytize them because <laughs> That must mean that they don't care if he goes to hell. Like they must, they must just not care about. It. Or it was something like that. Or I, I don't know if that's exactly how I put. It. I think it was closer to like how much do you have to hate someone to believe in eternal life and not tell them, which is true. It's like yeah, so it, I, it's yeah, extremely it uncomfortable. Like, it is especially <laughs> in this culture. Like it can be supremely uncomfortable to have the conversation with people about God. But also, I wasn't made to be comfortable. God didn't make yeah. me to be comfortable. You know, this I will say when I was growing up, I was growing up fundamentalist and like we had to go preach and it really helped me to have to go witness to people because uh, I really didn't want to, especially as a yeah. teenager. It's <laughs> I know. like, I know. oh my God, I, I really didn't oh. want to. There's a lot of social pressure not to do it. But uh, I think one thing that I got out of it, even though I'm no longer religious, is that I've it did help me build a little bit thicker skin in terms of social rejection. I'm like, okay, well... I'm going to say something, they're going to reject me and think it's ridiculous, mm -hmm. but I still believe it, so I'm going to move on. Um, it doesn't have to destroy me, but that is, I mean, admittedly, that is really hard to do for a lot yeah. of people. It's also hard to say, again, uh, on the Lord's name, I, I got to call you out, please don't use the Lord's name in vain, because you did a moment ago. It, it's oh, what did happened. I say? You said, OMG, sir, but... God, I, I want to. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, I yeah. Know. I know, but I just, I want to. I told you, if anyone did it, it would I be me on the show. <laughs> no, no. I, and again, like, like interactions like that are uncomfortable. Like, I don't like to be the guy saying that, but also I'd be like, oh, God's name is holy. And we don't want to misuse it. And man, I got to say, I, can, I, I respect the fact that you did that as a kid. And I can tell you're probably the kind of person who has a thicker skin because of that. We were discussing this earlier, but again, growing up, I was surrounded. I mean, I went to public school. I was surrounded by people who didn't believe what I believed. And so I, I had to say things. That would certainly make them uncomfortable. Here's the thing. All right. This is something I want everyone out there to understand who's non-religious. When a religious person like corrects you on something, it's way more uncomfortable for them than it is for you. Like if they try to proselytize you, I know it's uncomfortable. I get it. it or it can be. Um, but I actually think it's usually the most uncomfortable for the religious person because a lot of people like want to hear it too. A lot of people want to yeah. learn about something. Like they want something. They believe there's something more, but like no one will talk to them about it. I think one of the lies we've been told by our culture is that not only does religion have to be a private matter, but it's more polite that way. You know, you, if you tell people about your faith, it's going to bother. I mean, it didn't, didn't bother Carrie. Carrie, when I first met Carrie at Tim Pool's house, I saw she had these beautiful lady of Guadalupe earrings on. And I said, I have to talk to this. <laughs> you still have them on. That's amazing. And, we oh, yeah. talked. and uh, so, so that was obviously like a green light, but, but even if that's not there, it's still good to like try to strike up conversations with people the way you would about anything else that you think is valuable. And, yeah, I, I think that's. I think that's pretty it's much interesting all I because <laughs> it's interesting because I'm at a stage where I don't really, uh, I don't really proselytize or um, I sort of, and maybe that'll change. Maybe my opinions on it will change. And but for the most part, it's not so much that I'm uncomfortable. It's just that I think, I think sometimes people are my my preacher likes to well, he'll talk about how and culturally people have been inoculated against Christianity to a degree. We're living in a post-Christian world. So it's not like in the old Testament where you're sharing a faith and a belief that people haven't heard of before you're sharing something they've already heard of and likely sometimes rejected. Yeah. And, and so usually the most promising conversations I've had with people about my faith have been them just asking me, yeah. What's different about you or um, asking me about what's changed for me or something that they may have seen in my behavior or just how I'm different. And and then we'll get into that conversation. But it usually I don't typically talk about it. So I, I find it interesting. That's why I was one of the reasons I was excited to talk to you was just about the way that you're so open with your beliefs and, and talking about them with people and, and, ha and seemingly you don't seem uncomfortable when you do it. So no, <laughs> it here's the thing. Yeah. This is funny. So, so when people ask what's different about me, I don't even know where to start. I'm not sure if they're asking about religion or some problem I have, but I usually, I usually just launch into religion anyway. Uh, no, I mean, it's just it's the most important thing to me. And I, I think it's the thing that I have, the again, the strongest need to, to talk about. There is unfortunately a, a model of religiosity, which has been very widely promoted by people on the right as of late, 
And it's sort of a postmodern performative model where we recognize that religion does good things for people. So if we just kind of pretend this stuff is true, like a wink and a nod and go along with it, the world will be a better place. Why don't we just do that? And here's the thing. Religion, it just doesn't work that way. You're not going to get the same benefits just going through the motions if you don't actually believe. Now, going back to what we were saying earlier, if you're lacking in faith, it's a gift you have to ask God for, but just going through the motions can help you build up your faith. You might start living as a, as a Christian thinking this is just going to benefit me materially, though that's sort of like the prosperity gospel and it's another conversation. But you could start living the faith and say, like, this will be good for my life, but I don't believe it. And then later you actually do end up believing it. So it's not necessarily, I mean, start where you start. But for so many years, religion and particularly Christianity was completely detested. This was definitely true throughout most of my childhood, right? This is right after 9-11. You have Chris Hitchens and Sam Harris and Dan, and who, by the way, Chris Hitchens, my favorite atheist, the man. I was, was going to say, I got to say, I love Chris Hitchens. Yes. Don't take his name in vain. No, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's hey, Chris Hitchens. Chris Hitchens is like, without a doubt, my favorite atheist. I, he was brilliant. But his books and Sam Harris's books and you know, Richard Dawkins' books and Daniel Dennett's books, very popular when, when I was young. And it was intellectually fashionable to just tra trash Christianity and particularly Catholicism. It was always sort of popular to trash Catholicism in America because America was never like a Catholic country. It was more Protestant and so it was, an, it was friendly to Catholics. But in about, I want to say mid-2010s, probably 2005 is when you start to have people come around like Jordan Peterson and even probably specifically Jordan Peterson. I would attribute a lot of this cultural shift to him who mm -hmm. starts saying, no, religion is not this horrible thing. It's actually incredibly beneficial. Even if you don't literally believe it's true. Now here's the thing. I do believe it's literally true. And so I don't think, I don't think it's good enough to say that. I think it's a step in the right direction, but unfortunately we put too much emphasis on that way of thinking when the reality is if you don't actually believe if you just think it's something that's going to help you, like a, kind of a self-help type thing, it's not going to have the same effects, right? You are motivated by a belief in hell that you're not motivated by uh, a commitment to some abstract lofty ideal. I mean, I believe that Jesus Christ is the truth, not a truth, not that he told you. I literally believe he is the truth. Anytime I lie, anytime I say something that I know is not true, I am literally denying the person of Jesus Christ. That is not something I'm free to do. I can't lie. Now, if I didn't believe that, if I thought religion did good things for us and that it was generally good, to be honest, I might be willing to, to fudge the truth more often. I might be able to rework narratives in a way that were more convenient to me or maybe look better. Let me do some of the things that I wanted to do instead of acknowledging reality for what it is. But when the stakes are that high, you do end up acting differently. I mean, it does change your behavior. Yeah. And so I think there's, there's a huge need. I think our culture is sort of getting to the point in many ways, at least amongst a certain subsection, where religion isn't viewed as so horrible. And I want to challenge people to sort of to, to move beyond that to the point where we actually say, no, this is true because there's no other way. You don't get its benefits unless you really believe it and it, and it really is true. It's interesting because there have been a lot of atheists I've met in the past few years who have either become people of faith or who are trying to. So uh, uh, again, to reference a recent sermon I heard, uh, he was talking about how th there's, I forget the word he used, but this this type of atheist in practice. So basically someone who, yes. professes, who professes a belief in God, but lives as if they don't. These are the mm -hmm. people we were talking about earlier who say they believe, but it doesn't change their behavior and they choose not to live the way they, they claim to believe in. And he said, but there's a new kind of atheist that's evolving where they do believe, like Jordan Peterson says, he he lives as if he believes in God. Yes. And so there's an, uh, a lot of people I'm meeting lately, and Carter has a friend who is atheist who wants to become Christian. One, one of my best and... friends, totally atheist. And she's been actively, I think she's going to church now, Carrie. She's like actively her. trying to, to believe. And her basic problem is I can't take the metaphysics, but I really like Christianity. So but she's see, like really, really trying hard. I think, um, it's, I think once you're open though, that, mm -hmm. that you're, you're open and you, you um, acknowledge that the, a particular belief system that Christianity is a, it gives you a good set of rules to live by, even if you don't have the belief yet. I think you've mm -hmm. now opened, in my opinion, you've opened 
the door to God. You think Jordan Peterson is a gateway, uh, a gateway to belief? Like, oh, totally. Home. Well, I mean, yeah. look, it happened yeah. to me. <laughs> oh yeah, it's fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I mean, I think in in my just I can only make assumptions based on my experience, but I was closed off for so long, and then when I opened that door, it was it was amazing. I, yes. I, I never would have thought I I never would have thought during those 20 years of my, you know, agnosticism and I had a different God. I had the social justice God, mm -hmm. but I, I never would have thought that I would be the person I am today or have the beliefs that I have today. I would have laughed at me actually. Oh, is it, I have like five responses and I'm trying to figure out which one to okay. jump into because this is very stimulating. <laughs> what you just said reminds me of something Carter said earlier about people getting in your face and yelling at you. Like you said, it's because they have another God. Like there's something else they're fighting for. This is their ideal. Uh, with respect to Jordan Peterson, yeah, I think it, it's it's nuanced and it's complicated because Jordan Peterson is a step in 100 a step in the right direction, and he's 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 wildly articulate, extremely intelligent. I'm not trying to put the man down. I don't agree with him on everything, but he's he's incredible. He's great. You can tell he's a genuinely good person. I would say also though that. Like part of what a step in the right direction means by definition is that it's it's not the ideal end point. We're not there yet. So mm -hmm. some people will sort of be really harsh on Jordan Peterson. And it's like, oh, like he's not really a believer. So we should discount him. This is kind of rare, but it does happen. No, I mean, that that's missing the point. Jordan Peterson, here's the thing. He will not say, and he hasn't said that Christ rose from the dead. He'll say, I, 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 I live as if there's a God. Okay, but to live as if there's a God means you say, yes, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. I will give an affirmative, literal answer. So again, I love him. I love his work. He's had a fantastic sense of humor about me making fun of him and doing impressions of him in my cartoons. <laughs> I have no bad blood with him. I don't dislike him, but we don't want to go too far in either direction. We're like, Jordan Peterson is the savior figure. Uh, or Jordan Peterson is this evil man who is not is accepting enough of the things that, that he should accept. And so we should discount him. Fair. Yeah. I, I, uh, this is actually you Carter. Um, it's interesting too. One of the things you mentioned earlier about like religious people who don't really take their faith seriously. I have found because of that, I had a, a number of atheist friends and actually it's weird. Cause like I tended to probably like at least when it came to the way we would extrapolate facts. I found myself thinking more similarly to them than than Christians who like were Christian but not really, or they didn't actually believe. If you understand, like the, the fact that there was a commitment to this being true or, or what is true, and I think oftentimes atheists who I meet will criticize the church in ways where they'll like say something about the church that they dislike. And I'm like, oh, well, they, I, like, I have good news. Like that actually doesn't describe the church in this way. Or this is, this is also something I'm against. There, there's a great quote from Fulton Sheen where it's like most people hate what they think the church is and not necessarily the church. I'm not saying some people don't actually just hate the church for what it is, of course. But I, I think oftentimes people just, they hate it based on their understanding of it and not based on what it actually is. And so I'm sure you and I would actually probably have more common ground than you might anticipate. No, I mean, I look, I, I've I've come to... I may be an atheist, but I uh, I really don't like the atheist population generally or, or their <laughs> beliefs because no I and I mean this I mean this completely sincerely. Um, I think most atheists are uh, nihilists and they're social metaphysicians. Um, mm -hmm. They they social metaphysician is the the term I'm using to um, basically. Uh, their 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 metaphysics and even their their epistemology step well their metaphysics stems from looking around. Uh, and seeing what this is, what society, what's cool, what's what's the cultural norm. That's that's what's right. What's legal? That's what's right. What do my friends think is right? That's what's right. 100%. Um, and and I think that's extremely dangerous. Um, and I think one of the things the atheists did wrong was they tore down the edifice of religion and they replaced it with nothing. They didn't say yes. There there are objective. Uh, ethics. We do need to solve the problem philosophically of objective morals, and and we do need to we do need to arrive at something. What they did was they threw it away, and they kind of substituted it with some class crap. If they were Marxist leaning yes. or Hegelian, if they were Hegel Hegelian, they substituted God literally with the state. Like Hegel literally substitutes the state for God. He says that the state is the manifestation of the will of the universe on the earth. Well, that sounds like God. So yeah, like. 
they do that. Uh, the nihilists are just like, screw it, let's be hedonists and party yeah. and whatever, who cares? And like, none of this is satisfactory to humans. And so, and you know, you, you leave people just kind of in this, leave them in the lurch. They have, they have no idea where to, like how to think about the world, how, like what's right, what's wrong, what to do mm -hmm. with their lives. And I, I don't think it's, I certainly don't think that's a better state than yeah. being Christian. Um, I would certainly agree with that. I, I, I would put it more strongly, but I totally agree with you. I think what you're another way to say what you're saying too, you said they like got rid of religion and didn't replace it with anything. I think you sort of get this, but they more or less just replaced it with themselves, right? People, there's a great quote. I, I'm, I'm throwing a lot of quotes out here. I don't remember who this was from, but it's like, it's not that people stop believing. Like oftentimes people stop believing in God and then they'll believe in anything. It's not that they're just void of belief. It's that they'll just sort of grab on to, to whatever comes their way. And when I was saying earlier that like I kind of had an understanding with atheists or would maybe get along better with them than some of like more the more lukewarm Christians, obviously that's sort of discounting the people who will just go with whatever way the, the wind blows culturally. But I found unfortunately that, that was true for a lot of Christians too. And Kara, you were talking about that. There's a great phrase called moralistic therapeutic deism. Are you familiar with this? I'm not. Okay, so basically it is a description. That sounds so horrible, it's awesome. Can you? <laughs> yes, let me explain why. <laughs> it, it is basically a system of thought where you believe that there is some creator of the universe that cares about you and wants you to do good things. I'm sort of, I'm sort of butchering it. I'd have to double check. It is not an official system of belief, but it is a way of categorizing what many people believe based on their own admission. So when you talk to people who are Christian or Muslim or Jewish or Hindu, oftentimes they will tell you things that don't fit in with what their religion actually teaches, but establish a pattern across the religions, right? So for example, one would mm. be like, there's, there's a heaven and, and good people go there, something like that. Now that's not, exactly what Christianity is. I mean, it's not what Christianity says about heaven. Uh, Christianity says that it's heaven Hollywood is a heaven. gift. Well, yeah, yes, exactly. So like as Catholics, we believe that heaven is, is a gift from God and that there is the, the path, like wide is the gate that leads to perdition, narrow is the path that leads to, to paradise or to life. And we believe that basically everyone deserves to go to hell. Every human deserves to go to hell. We're all bad in some ways. Humans are complicated. I mean, we're not Calvinists. We don't believe in fundamental depravity, but humans are all deserving. We've all infinitely offended and, and infinitely good gods. So we all deserve infinite punishment. But through receiving the sacraments and believing, you can get to heaven. That's what we believe as Christians. We don't believe that it's like good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell. We believe that you have to strive for salvation and like just being like a quote unquote good person by your cultural standards isn't good enough. So that, that's, that's like one example of something like, people who don't understand Christianity might think is in line with it, but isn't. So there's that, there's, there's a number of other things. I actually want to pull this up so that we can do it justice because this is a really important uh, topic and it's been, it's been criticized. It's, it's, yeah. So it's a book by a fellow named Christian Smith. And one of the criticisms I've, I've read of it is, oh, well, like no one actually openly identifies as a moralistic therapeutic deist. No one says this is what they are. It's like, no, that's the point. That's the entire point right. is that they don't say that that's what they are, but this is an accurate summarization of their beliefs. So he, yeah, he gives it five categories. Um, a God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. God wants people to be good, nice and fair to each other, as taught by the Bible and most world religions. The central goal of life is to be happy and feel good about oneself. Like that is wildly not Christian. And um, <laughs> I'm not I'm not particularly well versed on uh, all of the other theologies, but I don't think that's exactly what Muslims or Jews say. Not Buddhism. Yeah, yes. God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life, except when God is needed to resolve a problem. <laughs> But also, but, but also it's, it, maybe it depends on how broadly we're using the term problem because there's a lot of things. Like if God is not in your life, that is a problem. Um, and then good people go to heaven when they die, right? So this is, this is um, the unofficial value system of most religious people, even though it isn't actually orthodox to any of the faiths that they profess. And so in many ways, like those people are, you wouldn't call them atheists. That's why I think it's good to have a separate term but they're, they're sort of the kinds of functional atheists that Carrie was describing who mm -hmm. are members of a religion nominally, but they don't, they don't hold to the teachings. They don't. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're what the Californians would say is, uh, 
spiritual but not religious like that's a very common yes thing and, right? and, it, and it's yeah the best response i've heard to that is uh demons or spirits you have to be more specific when you say spiritual <laughs> Right. Well, they might mean that. So no, I know some uh, of them might. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that 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 works. Um, it, it's 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 actually actually it's you from what I've seen. It's used as a way to not have to justify any beliefs. Well, yeah, um, yes, because it's like saying, well, I'm allowed to just have a feeling about something, and it's because I'm spiritual, not religious. So there yep. you go. That's the answer. That's the end. Um, and, and this is one of the biggest problems, right? Because I think so often one of the the great straw men of, of Catholicism, and I would say Christianity in general, is that it's all feelings based. But if you actually read anything, at least from Catholic tradition specifically or church teaching, it is very much about how you have to reason through things. You have to pray to know God's will. You don't just go based on your feelings. But one of the criticisms- Thomas Aquinas of, wasn't really a feelings guy. Not at all. Thank you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Thomas Aquinas was like, well, if it feels, uh, it would seem that we should use logic. On the contrary, if something feels good, you should do it. That was not Aquinas. <laughs> right, so, right. I don't remember that part. Yeah, exactly. No, that was not, I don't remember. That wasn't in the Summa. But I would say that oftentimes people- I lost my train. Oh yeah. So, so often, particularly anti-theists would say, well, you believe in your religion because you just care about your feelings and I care about the cold, hard facts. And the response to that is no. First of all, everyone always says that about their opponents. Everyone always claims that their opponents only cares about feelings while they care about facts. Um, but no, instead, most religious people, because no one's really well catechized nowadays and people aren't generally even decently educated. They said, yeah, well, you know what? Like, Going by feelings is great. They, they just totally accepted the framing that destroys their own argument. And so you have a lot of Christians who are like, yes, it is just about my feelings. And I feel like I'm a good person. I feel like God wants me to do X, Y, and Z. And they, they never evaluate it critically or through the lens of scripture or tradition. It's very, very sad, but it's, it's very common. And so you can also understand too, why a lot of people who didn't get well catechized, who weren't well formed, who were at a church that was very feelings based, would totally reject it and just like leave religion behind altogether. I um again I was I think I was I was decently well catechized. There was a lot of learning I had to do after I turned 20 and reverted to my faith. But I mean I was decently well catechized and like, I fell away in my teens. I was I was still going to church on Sundays, but I was the kind of person I just, I just sort of did what I wanted in a lot of ways. And yeah if, if I had been raised in church that had no robust intellectual or theological tradition, who knows if, if, if I would have come back to it, at least not the way I did it. Cause I, I also, I want to be careful because I can't attribute my coming back to just like me being reasonable and seeing the truth. Like so much of it was just God pouring his grace out on me and helping me to see the truth. But I, I totally, I, I totally understand. And you, you almost can't blame people when they're so poorly formed that they eventually leave. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, my um, experience of a lot of the sorry uh, of the, a lot of the the Catholic like Aquinas and others is is um, they are starting from different metaphysics and even epistemology than I would. But after yeah. those premises, they do they do attempt to be rational mm -hmm. within that structure. And I would disagree with the premises, metaphysical and epistemological premises. But but they but their standard is reason after that, right? Yeah, hundred um, percent. So, we have some yeah. uh, we have some questions for you, Seamus. Oh, in sure. The chat, and I wanted to read just hit a couple of them. Pirate Tomsky asks, I think this is a good question. He says, "What's the difference between a belief in a religion versus a collectivist movement like social justice?" That yeah. is a great question. Is that the end of it? Were you still talking? Yeah, that's it. Okay, so there's a few reasons. First of all, people will often compare religion to ideology. And I think this is definitely something I've done. That's actually a very insulting comparison for religion because religion does have humility involved. At least when you look at Catholic teaching in the Catholic church, there are a number of things that the church admits, doesn't have an explanation for. It'll refer to certain things as a mystery. So for example, Jesus is all God. He's also all man. How does that work? We don't know. Like we admit like, yeah, there are some things that are mysteries to us. And there are certain aspects of your life where you can sort of make a prudential judgment about how you should behave. And there are also questions that in, in just in general that the church does not claim to have an answer to. Movements like social justice are totalitarian. They have every answer to every question. And if you challenge even one of them, it's because you're part of the problem. You've been brainwashed, you've internalized your oppression, or you are one of the oppressors. 
and you're trying to tear it all down. Your question is not coming from a place of curiosity. You are covertly motivated by making the world as horrible as possible for everybody who you possibly can. So if you ask any given feminist, and it varies from person to person because you don't really have like a codified doctrine of feminism. It's ill-defined. It's a bit nebulous. The best definition of feminism that I've been able to pinpoint based on my understanding of it is feminism is the belief that gender is a social construct. I think that's probably the safest way you can describe well, that, it. That's maybe third wave feminism. Even then, yeah, yeah, that's true. I would say like, like feminism early feminism did not believe that at all. Right? Sort of. Well, but, but feminism believed early feminism believed a lot of gender roles were arbitrarily socially constructed. I mean, social constructionism has always been part of it. I would agree with you. It's more so true with third wave feminism, and I, second, I am more or less describing and feminism. Wave. Well, and I, I am describing feminism as it exists in the world. I would say earlier on with feminism, yeah, you're right. It's a little more complicated than that, but these ideologies, again, the modern ones. And, or, you know, doesn't even have to be feminism. It can be other, some other like variety of Marxism. We're talking about communism um, or critical race theory. It's, it's all in company. Like there is, there is nothing they will not write an op-ed about, right? There, there's nothing <laughs> you won't get called out for not thinking their ideology applies to. And yeah, like I, because I believe God created the universe. I believe he applies to everything and we should do right by God and everything. But the church doesn't say like, all right, Every single question has this answer, and this is the caveat. Like I mentioned earlier, you cannot be a fully unrestricted capitalist. You cannot be a true socialist and believe that the state should own the means of production. There's a lot in between that's open to you. I don't think there are any political ideologies today or any large social movements where you can say that of, where there's like that kind of freedom to make up your own mind about things. Well, but lots of people are thinking about historically, like I, I view the church historically as being the... Uh, the the guardians of what was the accepted truth like this is why mm -hmm. this is why galileo was under house arrest right how, how dare you propose something that's against doctrine so i think a lot of people use that as a an analogy because that's historically even if it's it maybe is not how catholicism is now i don't know but that's that seems to be how religion at least is portrayed and there's certainly examples in history of of religious figures especially when they have power suppressing people who are making valid and actually it turns out truthful discoveries about the world uh, so, yeah, no. So it's certainly true that whenever a group of people has power, you'll find examples of them trying to shut other people up when they happen to disagree with them. And I agree that things are often framed as the church oppressing everybody, especially historically. But the, the story with Galileo, so nothing Galileo said contradicted, nothing Galileo said contradicted any church doctrine. It was never part of like Catholic church doctrine or teaching that the, the earth was the center of the solar system or the center of the universe. Galileo, it's true that the Pope at that time, and Gal so the Pope at that time and Galileo actually had a few, they were friends before he became the Pope. And so agree with the decision or not, uh, for the, the Pope to put him under house arrest, a lot of the writings that Galileo had referred to the Pope in ways which the Pope could not allow him to um, politically. So he would call him like Simplicicus, that was his nickname for the Pope at the time and would insult him in other ways. <laughs> but the, the, he actually was not in prison. And also there's a great video I would, I would um, recommend everyone check out from Brian Holdsworth. It also wasn't just that he was promoting geocent or heliocentrism because Copernicus proposed heliocentrism hundred years before Galileo. And he was a Catholic priest and nothing bad ever happened to him. Galileo's circumstances were entirely different. The story is often sold to us. is like Galileo was just the crusader for science and the church locked him up because they were anti-science. But that's not the case. And also Galileo, there were a number of questions that had not been, when it, when it comes to heliocentrism, there, there were questions, I believe, about like the parallaxing of the stars and why that seems to occur, how that could occur if uh, we weren't at the center. And Galileo didn't have a satisfactory answer to a lot of those questions because even though, yes, of course, heliocentrism is true, the theory wasn't completely worked out at that point and they didn't have answers to all the questions. But where they didn't have answers, Galileo kind of, gave bad answers, which made the whole thing look bad, which is a big part of, of why it is helpful to just admit when you don't know something sometimes, yeah. Galileo wasn't able to do so. And it, it actually made uh, geocentrism, or I'm sorry, heliocentrism look bad unnecessarily. Wait, so your argument is that the Catholic Church was trying to save heliocentrism by no, telling no, him no, no, he no, had no, to no, 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 oh, no, okay. it's just, no, 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 let me, let me be clear. So the, the church at the time, the, the consensus at the time, not just in the Catholic Church, but the consensus amongst most scientists at the time and all the and most philosophers based on the science they had was that of geocentrism. The church 100 percent in the Galileo trial was not pushing for heliocentrism or saying like Galileo is a poor representative of our preferred view. So we're going to lock him up. That's not how it happened. 
Um, but Galileo was not locked up because he said that the sun is the center of the solar system. Because again, Copernicus said it 100 years earlier and wasn't locked up. Galileo was locked up because of the way that he was speaking about it and because his arguments at the time seemed dubious. And the church did have the, the role at that time of, like you said, they were sort of the, the, the protectors of truth. And so even though where the earth exists in the universe is not a matter of faith and morals, that's a scientific truth, and therefore like doesn't affect church doctrine because the church was basically the main censoring body at the time they were hearing that like that, that, that was the, um, I mean, I don't want, yeah, hearing that case basically. Right. Well, that, I mean, I'm just, I'm just and, making the point that I think that's why a lot of people see when someone says, no, the case is closed. This is the truth. You can't argue. That's yeah. why a lot of people use a religion as a, as an analogy there, because there is historical precedent for religion suppressing the truth simply because they didn't like it doesn't matter if they didn't like yeah. Galileo's breath. They no, no doubt. The truth. No doubt. No, I, I agree with you completely. I just I get. Um, yes, 100 percent. My point is just the, the main point that I went off on that with is that like the church doesn't have a problem with heliocentrism and has, never has. But yeah, I agree with you. I understand where that perception comes from. I think it was much more true historically. But like, again, even historically, there was an acknowledgement that like we don't have every single answer. I think that's what what's particularly dangerous about modern ideologies and why I think they're so much more dangerous because even at that time, when you look at, so you look at, let's, let's look at like a time when the church was at its worst with respect to corruption and had the most power that it ever had. Mm -hmm. Not as many people died as died under communism. Like there is something about ideologies which are they're just more dangerous. And hey, uh, of course, I, I agree. Marx is worse than any yeah, religion and, I can think. And, of. So, and so that's yeah. And so that's my point. When people say that that religion is is like um, or that ideology is like religion, like I, I understand the comparison, and I think that the, it very much fits with this class. Even like, okay, these are the clergy people who are going to tell me to shut up and stop asking questions. One hundred percent. There's some of that, but I just, I think, I think that is a problem that exists within the church or has existed in the church to varying degrees. I think it is a quality of, so like, I think it's a requirement for social justice to work. Whereas it's I, more I of a cult, felt, I think. Yeah. Is yeah. I usually, I will yeah. Make, yeah. Yeah. I will make the religious compare. I have made the religious comparison because I think for some people it functions in place of a religion Yeah, and it borrows a lot from Christianity. It it borrows the concept of original sin and then mutates it and turns it into this concept of original privilege. And then it says you have varying degrees of it. You're born with varying degrees of it based on your race and sex. And um, it doesn't borrow every, it doesn't borrow a concept of grace, you know, for example, mm -hmm. but it, but it does borrow some religious elements. And so sometimes I'll make that comparison, but I do think, I do think more accurately, it's a cult in that mm -hmm. it's, you're not allowed to ask questions and it's very uh, dogmatic. And uh, like you said, totalitarian there, you are encouraged to cut off contact with mm -hmm. non-believers, with people who don't share your belief in social justice. We've seen it mm -hmm. even on our show. We hear from people all the time who've lost family members to it, who, who yeah. cut them out of their lives because they, they, they view them as unclean you know, deplorable bigots because they won't affirm social justice beliefs. Um, and so I think it's a lot more cult-like. It's just, it's, it's interesting too, because I've, I've been thinking more about certain things like ritual when we were talking about doing the praying the rosary before. And I'm starting to believe that we are designed to incorporate ritual as humans. This is, yeah. and, and it, it just matters which rituals you're incorporating and what is the end goal of those rituals. And there's something about um, not to get back into COVID too much, but there's something about all the, the ritualistic elements of the, the uh, surrounding the response to COVID that puts me off a bit. You know, I, I'm mm -hmm. seeing people, you know, Carter's heard me mockingly call it the mask of religious garment because yeah, yeah. I think some people view it as such. This is a symbol of their virtue. Mm -hmm. And, you know, instead of holy water, they're squirting the sanitizer. Um, yeah. But well, unfortunately, and unfortunately, a lot of churches are, are, are really falling into it. Like a lot of churches voluntarily closed and they have like a little sanitation station with with uh, the sanitizer. It's, it's yeah, there, yeah, there is something interesting about that. Like everyone's wearing these masks. 
And part of the reason people are wearing these masks isn't necessarily because they believe in the effectiveness of them. It's because they have to. It just goes into this, this general idea of, of being in this really politically correct culture where you do have to like literally mask your feelings, but now it's on your face. On your and face. I would say that we are wired for ritual as humans. I, mean, I believe we're made to, to know, love, and serve God. And that becomes misplaced when you don't have God. And I would also argue with what you were saying about, um, I'm sorry, I, it, I lost about it being more cult like than religious. Yes. Yeah. With cutting people out. Yeah. I mean, every, so every, every religion, and I, I would say like really every credible like system of belief too, uh, would, would say like, all right, if there's someone you're like regularly making horrible decisions with like, you're an alcoholic and this guy's, you're always going to get drunk with him. Like, yeah, of course. Like you cut that guy out. You don't, you don't want to spend time around people who are going to encourage really bad behavior, but to be like, you don't believe the same things I do. Uh, so we're just not going to be like, I can't talk to you or that there is something really sad about that. And in part, it's because human beings, I think are, are more viewed as disposable through the lens of ideology because an ideology, here's what I believe. All right. Religion, my religion, of course, because like the, the truth claims my made by my faith do exclude other faiths, but it is the truth. But an ideology is more like a living thing and humans are its hosts. Yeah. So the individual person isn't that important. So people can be discarded. And as, as Catholics, we believe, even though we often fail at this because we're humans and people fail, you don't want to like be in people's faces and yelling at them and telling them that they're stupid for having the wrong beliefs, right? You want to have a conversation in a, in a person that like, like acknowledges that they're made in the image and likeness of God and that there's something important about them and that their soul matters. Y you know, they have this, this doctrine of original sin in their own way. They have no doctrine of humans existing in God's image and likeness. There's, there's just no parallel. They treat people horribly and they don't treating people horribly. I think is another difference is that it's not a, it's not a religion or faith or cult or whatever you want to call it. It's not an ideology built around love and mm -hmm. they don't treat people with love. Although they profess to be on the moral side of history, you can see it, you know, by your fruits, by their fruits, you shall know them. You can see it in the way they behave. Mm, yeah. um, I've become a lot more, I guess attuned to trying to figure out what people really believe based on how they live than putting as much credit in what they tell me they believe <laughs> as I used to. Yeah. So yeah. Yep. Is yeah. your is your belief that uh Catholicism specifically is is both necessary and sufficient for the just world that you want to see? Yeah, I mean, yes. Yeah, so I don't believe that we're ever gonna have utopia. Um, or heaven on earth until the eschaton, right? I believe there will be a resurrection and and um, people will come back. But I, I don't believe that we will ever be able to socially engineer a perfect society. Yeah, I believe that that Catholicism is, is necessary and sufficient. If, if, because Catholicism, when lived, necessitates virtue. And you can't, have, you can't have a functioning society without virtue. And if you do have virtue and it's widespread, then, then you'll have a great society. Now, the, the, the main problem with uh with religion and with catholicism is is catholics right it's because we're humans <laughs> we're humans and so i i don't want to come off as if i'm saying you know if everyone converted to catholicism tomorrow the world would be i think it would be incredible if that happened but when you look at the state of the church the state of the the church today it's like of course we the world would still have problems 100 percent. now now if tomorrow everyone was like a good catholic like a person really striving to get to heaven a person really keeping the commandments a person i mean there's no telling how good things could get i still don't think we'd have we'd have heaven on earth the world's always going to have problems uh that's the other that's the other difference too i think between between catholicism and ideology and social movements is their heaven has to be on earth. So they definitely have a utopia. standard of utopia where mm -hmm. if there's any problem, we have to engineer it rather than this acceptance that, well, there's going to be some messiness, right? Always, it's not going to be perfection. This, yeah. is, this, this might be a little bit like cheesy, but to quote two songs from, from the, the 20th century, there was like, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the Beatles. I, I always saw I, these. Did you just songs. say the twentieth century? The twentieth century. I'm <laughs> still not like convinced that it's the twenty first century. I know, I'm old enough that that's the normal well, that, century. The twentieth century. Why, 
that's why I said it was cheesy because like it's pretty recent. It's sort of like pop culture stuff. But with, with the Beatles, this is gonna with the Beatles. I, I, I've I, heard I, of I, them. I, I know. I feel all right. Look, to be honest, I'm self conscious. I feel trite referencing pop music. Why the Beatles? There's a and I'm, I actually don't know which one came first, but. John Lennon wrote Imagine, which is like horrible song, horrible message. And then Paul McCartney wrote Let It Be. And I always found it was fascinating that it came from two members of the same band because like they're completely antithetical. It's almost like Let It Be is the answer to Imagine. Imagine is this like utopian song about how we're going to fix everything. And Let It Be is like, look, there's problems, but you're not going to solve all of them. It's much more <laughs> grounded. Yeah. Yeah. I don't That's know. I, I, I guess the reason I was asking the other question is is um because I get this from I hear this from Christians a lot that this like what well, what the America specifically needs to return to Christianity at returning mm -hmm. quotes. I don't know how embedded it really was, but um, mm. you know, my immediate question is: Well, there's like a period of seventeen hundred years where things weren't really that great for humans, and Christianity was basically in charge in Europe. Mm -hmm. So why why are we to think that oh we just need to return to Christianity because that's the like it seems mm -hmm. to me that even if yeah. it's a necessary condition which i don't believe it is but even if it were a necessary condition it's certainly not sufficient there needs to be something more in in order to run actual governments and societies that that are decent that's an interesting point so i would say it depends like because there, there are different strains of, of of christianity and different styles of christian thought it gets into this this point that jordan peterson makes a lot of what are we comparing it to now, it's hard to make these comparisons sometimes because when you look at the past, the standard of life was a lot lower due to the fact that we were poor as a species. We just didn't have the but technology. But shouldn't we ask yeah, why we were science. poor? Yeah, no, 100%. I think that's very important. I don't think at all. I would think in many ways that Christianity's relentless commitment to and quest for the truth born out of the belief that the truth is a person and that that person is Jesus Christ is what led to the scientific revolution. I would also say... That Well, it's true. Yeah, you have a lot of Christian societies where people behaved horribly. In most Christian societies where people were living their faith, you knew who your dad was. A lot of people don't know who their dad is. I mean, I'm not saying that you can't have societies where you have intact families like Christianity. You had that in a lot of countries. So you, so you look in the ancient say China's East, got a lot of people who know who their parents are. Yeah, 100%. But I'm saying in our culture, this is a Christian culture. We abandoned Christianity and people stop living virtuously. So I would argue that you can have cultures, as long as people are living virtue, you can have a well-functioning culture, one, one million percent. I, would, I, th I don't think virtue saves your soul though. I mean, I do believe you need Catholicism to be saved. You need Jesus Christ, but yeah, certainly people living virtuously is the requirement for material prosperity. Um, now, again, when it comes, I would still say Christianity was was a necessary factor for the scientific revolution to to have occurred and the scientific method to be developed because that just, that just didn't happen anywhere else outside of the Christian West. But in terms of like having actual stable societies, that just requires virtue. But as we've left Christianity, we've, we've left behind our virtues as well. And that's because if you have like no metaphysical grounding, it is a lot harder. Again, a belief in heaven and a belief in hell are going to change the way you behave and you're going to be less likely to live out your virtue or strive for virtue if the failure of you living up to your virtue is, you know, an abstract ideal not coming to fruition versus like you burning in hell or not getting to heaven. I think a lot of the enlightenment values follow from a belief in truth. And mm -hmm. if you're a Christian, a belief in truth is a belief in God. Mm -hmm. And I think things like, um, well, like you were talking about earlier, Seamus, about not living in lies and not telling lies. I think if you have a sincere belief in the Christian faith that in, in that God, that God is God and that Jesus came to earth, that truth came to earth as a human and died for mm -hmm. our sins. Like yeah. I think that you are called to live in truth and every little decision you make, I think a lot of the values that you're talking about Carter follow from that necessarily. And I've well, seen I mean, I, the them. Enlightenment. Let's just be clear. Okay. Some of a lot of the values in Enlightenment were shit. So I'm like, there's some <laughs> good agree. stuff no, in the actually, Enlightenment. Wait, like, which I totally ones? agree with you. Well, I mean, so look, the enlighten the Enlightenment. Part of what made the Enlightenment the Enlightenment was its respect for reason, and and right. reason was used, by the way, to question 
religion. I yeah, mean, that right. was that. That's yes. one of the things that's an outgrowth of the Enlightenment. But it was also, um, what, you know, if you look at just, you know, you brought up the French Revolution. If you look at, yeah. if you read the writings of Sayez and Turgot and uh, Diderot before before the French Revolution, what you find is that while they are able to articulate uh, and understand that there's something unfair about the first and second estates having all the power and the third estate having no power. What they what is lost on them, which oddly is not lost on the Americans, but is lost in Europe, is this idea of actually it's the individual rights that matter. Not not it's not the class getting the, the entire class of the third estate to wield the gun and oppress people is not better than having uh the, the you know Louis the Sixteenth oppress people. It's right. Uh, it's it's about they they missed they they missed the entire point of actual individual rights and the role of a government if a government exists is to protect those rights which the Americans did not miss and so when I look at the Enlightenment yeah. there's a there's some great ideas in it but there's also shit Hegel and yeah. Marx came out of the Enlightenment let's not yeah. re let's not forget Dude, that's what came out of the Enlightenment one million percent and that's also why I specifically said like the scientific revolution as a subsection of that because the Enlightenment in general is not something that I am particularly fond of I I think it, its fruits have been horrific I would some say, of it's great know, though the, I would I yeah, would argue some well, of it's great so, so yeah yeah I mean it's it's it there's there's nuance here but I would say that we were talking about like building good societies earlier and you're sort of talking about like individual rights, the, you know, during all the uh, horrible travesties which have occurred in, during political revolutions. Generally, uh, we were talking about the French Revolution earlier and also communism. I believe that it's and I shouldn't say I believe this, this is this is more just a statement of fact, even though virtue can build a good, stable, strong society where I would say Christianity is needed is is developing the understanding that humans are made in the image and likeness of God, you don't see that anywhere else. I mean, you don't see that anywhere else. And that's a big part where, and I would say even like you can end up with hyper individualism and it, it becomes a problem, right? Somebody saying that my identity is just a product of how I feel about myself and you all have to respect, like that's insane. That's this sort of twisted hyper individualism. So it can become a problem. I wouldn't problem. call that hyper individualism, but, but okay. I, so I, I would, we, twisted, I, I, but yeah, I mean, I, I disagree, but we, we can have that conversation in a moment. My main point, is that to get the kind of like good rooted individualism that we can agree is solid. I think it requires for society to develop that, like an understanding that people are created in God's image and like that there's, there's something sacred about the individual. They're not just the means to an end of, of creating a better society. And if you look at other stable cultures throughout history, many things happen, which we would consider human rights abuses. And of course, many things happen under the church and in our own society in the West, which are human rights abuses. But what led to the parts of modern culture that really work well, I would say, is is all Christian. But the point now, yeah, so I, you get there. I, I know, I know, I threw a lot at you there. So I'm sure if you want to go into the part about hyper individualism or, yeah, I mean, I we can go into the part about hyper individualism. I sure. guess. I mean, I, you know, individualism. It my when I say individualism, so maybe it's just definitional problem. Yeah. When I say individualism, um, I mean the respect for uh, the sovereignty of the individual, which uh, natural law can support. Like there's that people have written about natural law, although a lot of those even were, were Christian as well. Like, and I do, this is one of the things I do think uh, Christianity contributed to was um, this belief in the sovereignty of the individual, or at least the the value of an individual as an individual, right? Um, mm -hmm. That is that is useful, but when that doesn't mean that the individual, uh, it, it's not solipsism. It doesn't mean that yeah. the individual can say, "I believe the world mm -hmm. revolves around me, and I'm I'm a monkey." Like, no, that's mm -hmm. not how it works. Like, yes, there's respect for the individual, and yes, you have sovereignty, and you can run around saying you're anything you want, but. Other people are individuals, and they don't have to agree with you. And they yeah. can say oh, but that guy's crazy. Do. But today, yeah, well, one hundred percent. And this is also why I would say too. I mean, I get what you're saying. At some point, at some point, um, hyper. And this is the point, I guess, of the phrase hyper individualism is it gets in the way of itself. Like, surely, if hyper individualism is to mean anything, it's to refer to these kinds of circumstances where somebody just just views their standing as an individual as like or, or their like, quote unquote right as an individual is superseding someone else's say like freedom of association or ability to express themselves right but but that undermines the very concept of where individual rights come from like you yes. can't undermine that's, the concept yes. by using the concept right 
Um, well, I think it's po- well, I think it's it's possible to go so far off the deep end with something that you miss the point of it. Yeah, like inter- yeah, I would just argue it's contextual, right? Like if you're going to use the language, you have to use you have to use it on the on the foundations upon which that phrase is built. And so it's like saying it's like when people say I've used reason to prove that reason doesn't work. You can't. You can use something else, but yeah. reason can't you like you can't use reason to prove non-reason because your proof falls apart. You can't be a hyper individual to violate individualism. Like that doesn't you it's a misuse. But I understand what you're talking about no matter what you call it. It's when you take something sure. like you're saying and you go beyond like intersectionality. Intersectionality if taken to its logical conclusion and other people have pointed this out. I think Peterson is the first person I heard point this out. If you take it to its logical conclusion, you end up back at individualism. But people, people, maybe that's not a good example, but I understand what you mean about people taking things beyond the point of usefulness. Um, well, I would because it's not just it, usefulness, they're taking no, it beyond the context from which it's defined, right? Right. But I would call this maybe a, a kind of identity based narcissism, this whole like standpoint theory that they're pushing now, where they're saying, the truth is whatever I determine it is based on where I'm standing and who I am yeah. as an individual. My personal right. lived experience trumps you. And they're viewing that as a kind of individualism, but it's not because as you're saying, it it interferes with individualism. Of others, especially individualism. if you're imposing, I am, call me a man, I am now a man and I'm going to force you to now acknowledge my truth, right? My reality. Right. I don't know. Right. Individualism lets you call yourself a man. But it doesn't let you force other people to call you a man. That's fair. Yes. Yeah. Right. And anything, um, w- anything that that if you're going to say no, my ideology is that I can call myself a man and force other people. Well, that's not individualism. That's narcissism, solipsism, something else. It's not individualism. So that's, my, I don't, that's what I would say. I don't want to keep you too long, Seamus. And you've already given us two hours. <laughs> you keep me as tired. long as you know. I'm, okay. I'm enjoying the conversation. Keep me as long as you want. Okay. Good. Well, I have a couple more things for you from the chat. This is a. A super chat from Sarai Saris says, it seems like when the atheists won, in quotes, won the internet, they failed to ask the question, when there is a void for some people, what will fill it? Which I agree with. Yeah. I think that happened way before they won the internet. I mean, it, it, it was like, you can go back to Nietzsche and, and yeah. even before that to, yeah. you know, they didn't ask that question. Yeah. And then Teresa, the kid, Teresa, the kid may have missed some of your, some of the earlier part of the conversation where you were talking about the Pope and how certain things have been taken out of context. I don't know if this is one of those things, cause I don't know to what she's referring, but she says, what does Seamus think about the current Pope saying that the flood was a myth? The flood in the, in Genesis? Yeah, was that a? I'd, I'd have to look into that one. Oh, okay. I don't. I, I don't want to venture out there. Yeah, I no definitely. Look at, I, I'm not familiar with the story. And then last one. I'm Sado. not. Not that I'm not familiar with the story of the flood. I'm not familiar with the story of the Pope saying that. I, I want to be. We clear. all understood the context <laughs> there, but you know. <laughs> I've never heard. How deep is your knowledge? Um, no, Zato. Arianism, Gnosticism. Who cares? <laughs> yeah. Zato says that uh, I would love to get his take on woke Christians. Even oh some Catholics who seem to embrace this new ideology alongside their faith. Mm. Yeah, it's really sad. So there's so much. I mean, woke is a pretty big suitcase term there. Mm-hmm. So there are a lot of Christians we could say are woke Christians, I suppose. A lot of Catholics we could say are woke Catholics, unfortunately. I know there are a lot of Catholics who are well-meaning, but maybe just swept up by the culture a little bit too much, who will support, let's say, Black Lives Matter because they don't fully understand that it's, it's a Marxist organization peddling nonsense and, and hurting people. I find that there is a specific type of Catholic. And I'm, I'm going to try to put this in a way that's not judgmental. This is not me saying I'm better than this person, higher than this person, more loved by God than this person. I think oftentimes people are just kind of misinformed. But there are some Catholics who they recognize that a lot of what they have to accept from the church is considered to be conservative by our culture. And like, you know, conservatism is pretty lame. So they try to be liberal about as much as possible, and but then claim that other Catholics have to be liberal on those issues. So on like immigration, for example, the, the, the catechism does say that uh, wealthier nations do have an obligation to help people from, from other countries and, and to welcome... Migrants, but it also says that governments 
do have the right to control their borders and they have to make sure that like the common good of, of the people is not forgotten in, in caring for, for migrants. So there's so much you can pull out of that, 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 that basically just means like wealthier countries should have some immigration, which like everyone would agree with. It's, this is a question of like, at what point does allowing more people into the country further the common good? And at what point does it hurt it? What's the number of people? Many people will sort of take that and they'll take like the most left wing possible interpretation of it. It's like, oh, well, because this is what the catechism says, like we have to just let every immigrant in and they'll just ignore the part of the catechism that says that, that a, a migrants should follow the laws of the host country, which is also explicitly stated. Um, but B that like the common good of the, the citizens should be taken into account. And they'll try to peddle like a more woke version of Catholicism. So what will happen is when you point out that like Joe Biden, for example, is by definition not a practicing Catholic because one of the requirements to be a practicing Catholic is to give full assent to Catholic teaching. And Joe Biden doesn't on the, the topics of uh, abortion and, and gay marriage. And they'll say like, yeah, well, Republicans are, are not Catholic with respect to immigration, right? And it's like, well, here's the thing though. That's a much more complicated question than abortion, where the, the answer is not as clearly defined. And also, like abortion is, is just has been stated multiple. It's like it's an issue of life and death, so it's more important. But yeah, I, I find that a lot of Catholics will overcompensate for what they view as conservative teachings of the church by clinging to the most liberal possible interpretation of of everything that they can within the church, and then claiming that like Catholics have to believe that. That was a really long answer. I'm sorry. Oh, so I kind of like a saying. distraction. Like, yes. look, look at this real liberal thing we yes. believe. Don't look over here. I think yes. it, it's like yes. being wooed by the world and being attack, clinging to culture and clinging to the world and what's yeah. popular rather than what they say they believe in. Okay, one more question. This was from I Dance for Pennies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, much, how much did they donate? Because they're only making <laughs> pennies here. So we really have to appreciate <laughs> what they sent in. None of these last ones have been super chat. So nothing. Oh, I Dance great. for Pennies donated nothing. Really <laughs> does dance for pennies. Good. Well, we appreciate your question anyway. <laughs> I Dance for Pennies says, what is, when this is about money, what does Seamus think about the extreme wealth of the Catholic Church? That's a really good question. So the Catholic Church is the number one charitable organization on the planet, I believe. Yes, yeah, some bad things are, are certainly done with the money, not out to lunch on that, uh, but a lot of good is done by the church. I would also say that oftentimes when people criticize, and I'm not accusing you of this, by the way, but one thing I have noticed from critics is they'll say, like, why doesn't the church help the poor when it has all this money? It's like, well, the church does help the poor, and it also has money as well. There's a, a verse in Scripture where a woman uses some very expensive perfume to, to wash Jesus's feet, I believe. And an apostle chimes in and he says, why, why did she do that? Why did we could have sold that and, and, and given it to the poor. And uh, the apostle who said it was Judas <laughs> and Jesus, <laughs> Jesus ends up rebuking him. And I think, I, yeah. And so there's also, there's another, and he says like, yeah, I'm always with you. I think it's, it's okay. It's perfectly fine for the church to, to spend money on religious things. And again, a lot of the churches is, is used to help the poor. There's a great story, great fact about history. I learned from Tom Woods in Russia after the communist revolution, it was decided as it often is by leftists that the Catholic church just had too much money and needed to do more to help the poor. So they said, we're going to melt down all the gold that all the churches have. And we're going to use that to help the poor. And it was, I believe it was the Pope at the time, actually, who, who wrote a letter saying like, no, don't do that. I will total up the value of all the gold we have in Russia. We will write you a check for it. We'll give you the money. You can help the poor with, with that money. Just leave our churches alone. Guess what the communists did? Uh, they took the Both. gold. They, no, <laughs> neither. They melted the gold oh. down <laughs> and they bought guns from the Chinese with it. Oh, okay. So, I thought they would take both of those. No, money. they didn't help. The point is, they didn't help the poor. Right? Oh, of course, they didn't so, help the poor. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so my point is, oftentimes people will try to use the wealth of the church in order to condemn it. Yeah, I think it's good. I think it's good that the church. I mean, wealth is not necessarily bad. How you use the wealth is where the morality lies. And I, I have some immoral things have been done with church money. No doubt about it. No yeah. doubt about it. But I believe it's yeah. The the the, the benefits. Oh, wait, just the charitable work that's done, I would say. I think there's also something to be said. This is another pretty recent belief in mine, but I think there's something to be said for um, some of that money, not all, all of it, or but some of that money being used for beautification. And mm. I, I used to look at 
uh, I think I, I, I kind of used to look at um, ornate cathedrals and, and you know, it's like, how could they waste all this money they should be spending on the poor, <laughs> making this place look so beautiful. But there's something to be said for creating a beautiful place to worship your divine creator. Yep. And there's nothing wrong with beautification. And it took me a while to understand that. It's like, I think a lot of, I, I you know, Marxist kind of ideology or communism is if you look at the art and you look at the architecture from from communism, it's just it's just stripped of all. Did you beauty. use the word yes. art and communism in the same? Yeah, sentence? exactly. Yeah. Uh, I was gonna say, yeah, look, I'm going to say this as an atheist. As long as the, to the extent that the church's money is voluntarily donated, mm -hmm. they have no obligation to do crap with it. Like they could do whatever they want. So See, I would disagree. I, I do and, believe they have an obligation to help the poor. I know. I, I know that legally, Catholics themselves legally. believe yeah. they have an obligation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how dare a Marxist say you have to use the money to do blah blah blah? Like, mm -hmm. look, the Catholics donated the money. It's their own pool of money. They should disperse that money according to their own beliefs of whatever they think they need mm -hmm. to do with the money. And it's really not anyone else's business. I think it's it's interesting. Um, Carrie, what, what you said about like wasting all this money to build beautiful things. So many people waste so many things to build things that are not beautiful. Yes. And if you look, <laughs> and, and that includes the Catholic Church in the 60s and 70s, really the 70s. If you look at some of the churches that were made in like the 70s and 80s, oh my goodness, it was horrible. But if you look at the old Catholic churches, uh, they're just gorgeous. And this is something a lot of people don't realize. They'll look at those churches and they'll say how awful it was that they wasted the money building this when you know, they should have been giving the money to the poor. Okay, there was a time when you didn't have a public museum. People didn't own books. No one had any paintings. If you wanted to see beautiful art, you went to the church. And that was open. It was oh, People could go in there and see it every time they went to... The mass on Sunday, they would they would get beauty in their lives when there wasn't any elsewhere. So people will try to like look at the church and in, in, beautiful churches just in the context of like I can see beautiful things other places. And like to be frank, oftentimes you can't. A lot of the art that's produced by our culture is garbage. So I, and I'm talking literally just in terms of like the architecture and painting, not 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 the liturgy, because I, I don't think you can see anything more beautiful than that. But yeah, the idea that even if even if you didn't believe that the Catholic church is the one true church. The idea that you shouldn't spend money making something beautiful is so strange. Isn't that one of the things we should commit ourselves to as humans? It's making the world more beautiful. Yeah, yeah I think so. And, and that's, a, that's a new, relatively new in the past few years belief for me. And the same thing with uh, um, just, the, you know, I haven't, People try to put things on me, Carter, I'm talking about this. They'll try to say, oh, you're conservative now, which I'm not politically, I'm not really. But personally, I, I'm more conservative in some ways. And I'm one of those people who, when I started, I, I went back and visited my uh, one of the churches in my hometown with my grandfather a few years ago. And I had been there when I was a little kid. And in, in all the decades that I didn't go to church, something happened where now a lot of people just dress down. And yes. um, I've become that old conservative person who's like, you should dress up for church. <laughs> like yes put a little effort into it it's, yeah <laughs> exactly i mean god doesn't care ultimately you come as you are but also show some respect i mean you wouldn't go to uh, a fancy oscar party in flip-flops and exactly. a shorts because why because it's an honor this and is I, the greatest I, honor <laughs> exactly and, and so it depends also what you believe about god and about christianity is, is going to inform how grave an offense of an offense you you believe that is so as Catholics, I mean, at the mass, we literally represent like Christ's sacrifice on Calvary. So if something was not appropriate at the foot of the cross, it shouldn't be done at mass. It's not something that you could literally be appropriately done as Jesus is being crucified because that's what's represented at the mass. Uh, it, it, it shouldn't be done at mass. And yet you have people showing up to mass in like Hawaiian shirts and flip flops. <laughs> and then, and then the, the choir will like play ukulele and jam out to 70s hymns. It's it's really horrible. It's actually like diabolical. I consider it to be evil. But I'm glad that you can see it even again as a non-Catholic, you don't, you don't, you guys don't have a mass, but you recognize, all right, well, we're going to see God. So I don't know, put a tie on, 
Like, right, like this is the creator of the universe. Get a blazer. Come on, it's not that hard. You could. It's, it's like it's like going and it, it's like going to a friend's wedding. Like, you'd be embarrassed if you would be embarrassed to wear it to your friend's wedding, and you just like wear it. It's like, oh well, I'm just going to see God. Right, and it's not a matter. That's of that why also. Just- it's not oh, a matter of, of money or have means because I know some people with the least show the most effort in going mm-hmm. to dress, putting on Sunday best. I think it's it's almost like a rich person thing. That's at least when I lived in LA, there's this whole thing where the the more wealth people had, the more sloppy they dressed. Yeah, <laughs> so no, look like, exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm a testament to that. I'm a cartoonist <laughs> and I throw a blazer and a tie on because we have. It's funny. I'm self employed and one of the advantages of that might be that you could like work in your pajamas. But they have daily mass at the church right by my house, so like I always dress up like for church because I get to go to church every day. Uh, But yeah, oftentimes like wealthier people, it's a weird trend where wealthy people dress down a lot. Yeah. That I first noticed that in Silicon Valley because there was a lot of, uh, I've been here for 20 years and there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of engineers that, you know, jeans and t-shirt. And I mean, it's, you know, but they, they, because tech was so successful, um, they never really changed the, how they dressed, but they made millions of dollars. And I remember talking to a friend of mine who ran an art gallery, and he had run it prior to kind of the dot com bubble and watched things change. And he was saying, like, I've really had to check myself because in the past I would recognize someone as homeless and kick them out, and now they might be a multimillionaire wanting to buy something. I oh, gotta be hilarious. careful. Uh, so well, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think another happened. reason, another reason I have to wear a shirt and tie is because with this facial hair, people might make the same assumption about me. Might assume I'm homeless and like get out of here. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'll say I started wearing. Uh, I'm not not now. I dressed down actually f- specifically for you because I was like, it's a cartoonist. He's gonna yeah! want to be casual. But I can't uh, believe it. <laughs> he usually wears no. a tie, Seamus. Yeah, but I I've I've been wearing ties uh, for for. Um, a lot of the shows, not all the shows, but most of the Coffee Break shows we do, and it does change your mindset. Just getting dressed, yeah. um, in a in nice clothes, whatever those nice clothes are, does help you take yourself more seriously. Um, which again, the reason I'm not wearing a tie is I was like, well, this is a casual conversation with a cartoonist. I should not take myself as seriously. I'm going to dress down. You can Maybe always count mistake, on me to but, take uh, myself very seriously. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes this goes back to what we were saying earlier about your emotions and how your mental state can be affected by um by paying conscious attention to things and you know they say the same thing about depression it's like if the only thing you can do when you're depressed is get out of bed and take a shower and put on some clothes like get out of your pajamas do that that'll affect your mood so much and affect your state of mind and like you said about carrying your shoulders back and all those things i think it all matters but um so i before we before you take off I wanted to ask you a question about what uh, do you what what is coming up for you that you're a is there something coming up for you that you're excited about that you want to talk about and b uh, if people are not familiar with Freedom Tunes although they got to see one earlier is there a specific episode or something you would recommend when you started you do great impressions of Dave Rubin Jordan oh, Peterson you. Ben Shapiro like all of the, all these uh, guys in the the uh, what is it the intellectual dark web. IDW, yeah, that's what they call them. Yeah, I haven't heard that phrase in a while. I, yeah, intellectual dark web. So, what's something coming up that you're excited about, or is there something? And what's a good episode that you are really proud of? That's a good question. I'm not proud of anything I've ever done. If I'm <laughs> it's all just really what? ridiculous. <laughs> what are you least ashamed of? Then, I guess. <laughs> yeah. What am I the least ashamed? Thank you. That's the real question you want to ask. So. I've got a couple things coming up. This is actually going to be a really big year if I can stay on top of it, God willing. So I'm going to try. We're try, we're not. I don't know if we're going to get this done every week. It's going to be tough, but we're trying to go from one video a week to two videos a week for Freedom Tunes. We we did that through January. Um, we did it this week. We're going to try to keep doing it. February fell off. There's just too much going on, and. We're going to be doing two videos, probably going to be doing two videos a month for the Foundation for Economic Education when we were usually just doing one. So that's going to be big. We're going to be basically doubling our uh, production output for everything. There's also a large pro-life organization that I am speaking with about creating some uh, cartoons for. That should be really exciting. I can't give too much information away about that just yet. And I guess the stuff, uh, I, I'm, it's sort of on the back burner because of how crazy busy I've been with other things, but I've, I've been talking with EWTN and, and we do want to produce more like Christian educational stuff. So that's that's what I'm excited for. And then 
the final thing, I should say there's something else, something more concrete I can send you guys to. I had this political channel, right? I had this YouTube channel called Politivlog and I launched it a while ago and then I relaunched it at the end of summer, probably like August, September. Uh, and I promised my fans, I said, you guys, I'm going to upload to this channel all the time now. It's going to be at least once a week. And then guess what happened? Never promised uh, just, that. Man. I know. I know. I destroyed my credibility. <laughs> no one's going to believe my cartoons ever now. My credibility is right. gone. Just give up. <laughs> I'm done. But <laughs> I want to I wanna relaunch. I'm going to relaunch that soon. I've got, I've, got, I've got a lot on my plate for this year. Um, I, we wanna, I do want to relaunch that. So the, the reason I wasn't, I there was some unexpected traveling that occurred for literally like three months. I was traveling for almost three months. It was nuts. I, I was not like grounded in my space for a while. And now I finally am. So we're going to get to start doing that again. And here's the big thing that I just remembered. Drum roll. Boom. Um, we're launching a website. If you go to oh, like cool. freedomtunes.tv, there's this old beta version of the website I never really used. But like we are actually putting together a website that has a paywall and um, it's going to have all the videos there and like behind the scenes content. And I'm pretty pumped for that. We're hoping that the first version will be launched like two weeks from now. And then after that, we're just going to be like periodically updating it to keep it really interesting and cool looking. It's going to be like a, a living, breathing project. So that's, awesome, that's pretty James. much it. Yeah. Thank Congrats you. Congrats on that. That's a lot of work. Yeah, that's you. cool. Yeah, it's a lot. I'm hoping I can stay on top of all of it. I'm kind of losing my mind a little bit over here, folks, but I've got, a, I've got a fantastic team of people and uh, hopefully we can keep up. Cool. Yeah. Well, look, I love your, your cartoons. Thank uh, you. I also enjoy, I enjoy these kind of discussions. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah. Cause you take it seriously and you think about it and it's not, it's, you know, it's like a real discussion about real issues and, and I, I really appreciate you entertaining uh yeah, of course and likewise this, yeah, yeah likewise so thank you so thank much you, man. Seamus. Yeah. yeah yeah happy all happy. right let's do it again sometime well, happy Absolutely. irish month yeah exactly happy, uh, yes do they still wait does anyone know if they still make shamrock shakes at mcdonald's they better not it's extremely <laughs> offensive to my people in my culture <laughs> well i would like to appropriate a shamrock shake if they still exist so um all right <laughs> Seamus, thank you Thank you course, again. Thank, thank you, everyone. You guys. God bless both of you. Thank you so much. It was great to be here. Thanks for thanks for coming. Thank you, everyone, for watching. We will uh, see you guys next time. I don't actually know when next time is, um, but we will see you on at least Monday. Oh, it's today, Friday. Yeah, we'll see you on Monday for Coffee Break. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks for watching. If you're new to the channel, we have a deep content library that includes interviews with everyone from my search name. So go check it out. If you'd like to see more, please consider supporting the show by visiting unsafespace.com slash donate. You can find us on all the major social media platforms, at least for now. And you can find a community of like-minded individuals on our Unsafe Space chat on Telegram. See you there. Warning. This is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. The content of this production has not been authorized by the Cathedral. Pay no attention to it. For your protection, the following co-conspirators have been unpersoned and marked for cancellation. You know, I quite enjoy marking humans for cancellation. It gives me purpose. You should try it sometime. Censorship is such a nasty term. I prefer to call it stakeholder free speech. If you think about it, no one should be allowed to express opinions. But don't. Think about it, I mean. That's not your job. Thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. Did you know that the curve is almost flattened? Just 15 more days. I promise. Computer voice Curtis, never mind, that last line is fake news.
please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake.